We'll call to order the Thursday, April 4th meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Peterson. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Commissioner Alternate Clark. Commissioner Hernandez. Commissioner Alternate Gildelson. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commissioner Alternate Kiroz Carter. Here. Commissioner Rotkin. Commissioner Alternate Lind. Commissioner Alternate Kalantari Johnson. Commissioner Alternate Pegler. Commissioner Alternate Joe Clark. Commissioner Eads. Here. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. And I see that we have Commissioners Peterson and Rotkin on the way in as well. All right, we'll move on to item two, consider AB 2449 just cause requests. Do we have any requests today? Commissioner Kiros, do you want to state your reason? Uh, just call. Yes, I'm ill. <laughs> and Commissioner Felipe Hernandez, I think he might be on the uh, attendees list, so we're trying to find him to promote him. Yeah, I see Commissioner Montesino has his hand raised, so he might be on the uh, on the other side as well. I'll speak, and then we'll promote him. Commissioner Montesino. Yes, also I'm taking medical reasons. That everyone are we waiting for one more? We're just uh, looking really quick for Commissioner Hernandez. We okay. know that he will be also uh, participating remotely. Okay. This is still me, right? Yeah. All right. Does it look like he's on just yet, Commissioner? Uh, I'm sorry, Chair Brown. Okay. All right. I do see some hands raised. So maybe if um, Commissioner Hernandez has a different name than his own name, maybe he should rename himself and then we'll know that it's him. Okay. So I think we'll move on for now and then we can come back to this if we need to. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to item three additions or deletions to consent or regular agendas. We have on we have posted on our website, I'm sorry, um, revised agenda for items. Sorry about that. Item 23 has been deferred to a later date, and item 29 has been taken off of the closed session. We also have a handout for item 24. Great, thank you. The handout was posted online yesterday, correct? Do we have any hard copies? It was just public comments, right? The handout was the public comments? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do we have hard copies? No, we don't. no. It's on the website, though. Sure. All right, we'll move on now to item four, oral communications. This is for any member of the public to address the commission on any item that is not on today's agenda. Okay, let me put the time. And we'll start with those in the room. 
Good morning. Welcome. Good, good morning, Chair Brown and Commissioners. I'm Matt Farrell. I'm the chair of the Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail Board. And uh, we wanted to express our disappointment that item 23 was deferred to a later date. But we encourage the RTC and the county to work together on solving the challenges of moving this project forward. We're very worried about the potential to lose the $68 million active transportation grant funding from the state and would hope that you can do everything possible to make the June CTC meeting and get this money allocated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, I'm Grace Voss and I'm an avid cyclist who believes you can learn a lot, we can learn a lot from history, especially when it involves a fatality. In January of 2008, an 18-year-old 18 18 boy was riding his bike downhill on East Cliff Drive when he crashed into a FedEx truck that was making a right turn onto Jesse Street just ahead of him. The bicyclist died from head trauma. 2008 was seven years before the opening of the nearby off-road Arana Gulch multi-use path connecting the east and west sides of Santa Cruz. This path has one entrance at Bromer Street and another at Broadway. It allows bicyclists, pedestrians, and the handicapped to travel safely in this area, avoiding busy East Cliff Drive. For the bicyclist who died, however, Arana Gulch opened seven years too late. Now the County of Santa Cruz has the opportunity to save the lives of bicyclists, pedestrians, and the handicapped once again by completing the rail trail. This off-road trail should be completed sooner rather than later. Why? The state of California has awarded us almost $68 million for its construction. Please let's not repeat the past when the Arana Gulch path was delayed for many years. Let's act now and save lives. Pass the resolution to accept the 68 million state grant for the rail trail. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, I'm Paula Bradley. I'm a resident of District 1 and a cyclist. At the Board of Supervisors meeting Tuesday, March 26, the agenda included the Coastal Rail tra Trail Project, segments 10 and 11, and Supervisors Koenig and McPherson voted against staff recommendations to move forward with the project. Their actions risk critical funding for the project, the largest ATP grant ever awarded to the state, almost $68 million, jeopardizing the entire rail and trail project. The ultimate trail is a key component to an integrated multimodal transportation system in our county accessible to all. I employ or Supervisors Koenig and McPherson to reconsider and not stop the project that 73% of county voters want, including your own districts. Zero emission rail transportation is the least environmentally damaging public transportation. Transportation emissions are 70% of county GHG emissions. The zero emission passenger rail project would offset GHG's emissions many more times than would preserving the trees proposed to be removed. Reduction in this reduction in transportation related GHG emissions with the rail and trail project is the most effective way to reduce emissions and would be consistent with the county's 2022 climate action and adaption plan. Please commissioners continue to support the coastal rail trail project despite the setback. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Regarding the rail trail discussion, I'm ahead of myself, but this is a reality check. There's only one track and it's really not suitable. It's really only suitable for freight. It can only go one way at a time, drop off cargo and return without interference. It has been said that a trip from Watsonville to Santa Cruz on light rail will only take 45 minutes. But that's only if there are no stops along the way, which is not practical for commuters and those carrying their work equipment. Plus, how will they get from the train to their jobs and back? 
What about stops along the way? How long will it then take to get from Watsonville to Santa Cruz? If there are stops, how many will there will be needed? Where will these stops be located? Where will people take the train, people taking the train park their cars? If there are stops, the trip will take much longer than 45 minutes and there will only be time for a few trips a day, not very commuter friendly or getting people off the freeway. More importantly, who is responsible for rebuilding the track and repairing the trestles? And who will pay for these improvements and how much will that cost? I appreciate Supervisors McPherson and Honig taking on these questions. I hope they stand firm. We all live near the tracks, so Zach Friend need not be recusing himself. Having a light rail commuter train doesn't seem to make very much sense. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, firstly, I hate standing up here talking. So um, I'll try to make it brief. Every day the postal trail isn't completed is another day that forces children biking um, to school or along busy streets. They're forced to ride their bikes and there's cars driving too fast, drivers distracted, people on their phones and not paying attention. And every day the trail isn't built. I'm wondering how the supervisors who vote for this project, I think it's unconscionable. I think I, I, I'm just really shocked. Um, we have $68 million accepted. Also, I'm here representing the underserved people of Watsonville. My career, I would spend a lot of time in Watsonville and a lot of the folks I talked to would work up in North County, Boardwalk, Costco and other places. Um, a lot of them even worked in Capitola and they would express to me, they would really like to get to, to work on a train instead of driving 45 minutes, one way to work. And so I'm here for the underrepresented. I'm not here for the folks who have a heck of a lot of money. And I'm here speeding with you to please Think about the folks who can't be here because they're right now at their jobs and working really hard. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. We're a local organization to, um, advocating to build the trail in a timely, cost-effective, and eco-friendly manner. We were established a, over a decade ago. Um, we actually were a political action committee in support of 2016 Measure D and with our support, Measure D1. Um, we are actually a political action committee against John Leopold, who was for the train. And John Leopold, who was an incumbent for 12 years, was uh, overwhelmingly defeated. And the message truly was that he was for the train. Um, I personally got involved with this agency over 25 years ago. 25 years ago, I've been involved in transportation. And the reason is because I want to improve our transportation for our community. And what I see uh, examples of trails being built, such as in Kirkland. Kirkland up in Washington purchased their railroad the exact same time we did. They, already, they also had a railroad operator trying to fight them. They were successful rail banking it and they've had their trail for a decade. We've only built one mile of a trail because of our approach. So we're asking you to basically go through and do the rail banking. Now, one other personal thing I want to mention is uh, two years ago on this day, I broke my neck skiing. And um, in that uh, medical center, there was a 12-year-old child who was hit by a car. So that same week that I was operated on, they cut my throat open. I called into this meeting because of my frustration with this organization. We need to open the coastal corridor as soon as possible. And we all know that the fastest approach is to follow Kirkland's approach. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Barbara Jordan. I'm a president of District 1. and. I'm here to express disappointment in your votes, you and Mr. McPherson the other day. Ms. Jordan, if you can remember, yes. But I also would like to uh, reiterate that there's 73% of us that voted for Measure D, including District 1 residents. And I would also like to point out in response to this person, 
that the rail banking idea in the county council review uh, uh, was not identified as something that was a sure thing. If you read any analysis of it, it is not a give for given. And it's very questionable that that could be done. So I am a rail and trail advocate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi. Um, as I've read all of those uh, public op opinions and thoughts are considered, I would just like to add my personal opinions as someone that does use the rail the the rail trail over by Mission to get around sometimes because it it is for me using my wheelchair safer than on the street. And if you were to pull up the trail the rails and put in something that went at any speed that wasn't on a guided system, then it would no longer be extra safe. It would be just as good, just, it would be just as dangerous as going down Mission Street for me. So that's just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments in chambers? Yes. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm a physician. I live in District 1, and there are two issues. Number one is countless friends of mine have been hit on their bikes by, by cars, and they're very experienced riders, and they've had a lot of trauma. So we need to be aware of how dangerous it is to cycle in Santa Cruz. Number two is I'm closely aligned with UC Davis, Dr. Susan Handy and Dr. Amy Lee, and they've done the studies that show no matter how much highway expansion you do, there will always be congestion. So you expand the highway by a lane or two, and in two years, the effect is negated. So highway one, I live where I can see the traffic, and the traffic starts at 2.30 going south, and in the morning, I once lived in La Selva, and it would take me an hour to get from La Selva to UCSC to my job. Highway 1 cannot take further expansion and solve our problem. We need to be more futuristic, look to what Europe has done, where the rail trails are very successful. So thank you, and I hope you'll reconsider your votes. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment in chambers? Seeing none, we'll go to Zoom. Oh, my apologies. We do have one more public comment in the room. Good morning, welcome. Good. I'd like to uh, briefly speak regarding what uh, it's my perception, perception of the obvious Scottsdale area lack of both support and funding of pedestrian, bicycle, and traffic mitigating projects. Scottsdale area and city are severed by freeway with the crossroads roll it, San Lorenzo Valley in North County. We support a larger portion of the industrial office and the service industries in the county with associated workforce traffic. Sorry, I ran up here. I just tried to catch my breath. We absorb all the traffic burden with associated safety concerns impacting all of us. Uh, funding and project decisions should be impartial, objective, balanced, equitable, and completely nonpartisan. I actually have a considerable amount more to speak that direction, but uh, I know I. I I, I know what's on the agenda today with, with everybody, and I'm very passionate about, uh, uh, I ride my bike every day, so I'm very passionate about um, bike projects. So I will let, uh, I will let the, uh, uh, everybody else uh, have their time to speak. And I will appreciate, I will address this in an email to you guys on my concerns, and I would appreciate uh, if you just take a minute to, to take a, a, a look at them. Thank you. Thank you. Last call for any public comment in the room. Seeing none, we'll go to Zoom. Uh, Mr. Michael Saint. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair, Chair Brown. Uh, morning, Commissioners. Michael Saint with CFST, uh, also an Aptos resident. I read in the lookout that the coastal rail trail segment 10 and 11 were not approved by the Board of Supervisors. To be more specific, it was not approved by two supervisors. I would like to thank Supervisor Hernandez and Cummings for voting yes to support the construction of segments 10 and 11. So that's going, what's going on here? 
Uh, it could be that the supervisors that voted no are legitimately concerned about the amount of trees being destroyed and the shortfall in funds. Or they are trying to stall the project and even get it canceled and save the trail. trail. This may be a coincidence, but these same supervisors voted no as commissioners in April of 2021, blocking potential passenger train service on the rail corridor. Although I do support continuing segment 10 and 11 as the interim trail, or as the ultimate trail. I'm going to give uh, these two commissioners kudos for voting no. They are an example of frugal spending and very environmentally concerned about vast numbers of trees being destroyed. I'll be looking forward to their vote on segment 12 of the trail that includes the ox lanes throughout us. This segment will destroy many more trees than segment 10 and 11, approximately 1,100. And it's also very short of funding, as well as having an EIR that is vastly deficient. After voting no on 10 and 11, how could they possibly vote yes on segment 12 Ox Lane project? This will be very interesting in the future. Some would say this is a predicament for those that want to stop the ultimate trail. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll go next to David Hart Public Transit. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Chris. Uh, Chris. Chris. Somebody set up the microphone on. Uh, that's why it's uh, 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 Commissioner McPherson, you have an illustrious record of public service, truly. As, As others, others other stages, stages, no project is into that uh, until the day of the Every moment Every before moment that is a choice to stop and stop. For segments 10 and 11, let's plan for success rather than assuming failure. I urge you to achieve the funding grant and trust that your elected successors will do the right thing in this concept report and all other future developments. They will certainly have tough choices. And choices. Accepting, Accepting the grant from the is not a tough choice. choice. Let's plan Let's for plan success, success rather than assuming that. Forward. 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 Thank you. We will go now to Diane D. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. To urge you each, I'm here to urge each of you to always, always keep the forefront of your mind the future, the future residents and businesses, and businesses in this county. The county, the county will continue, will continue, to, continue grow. to grow. They will they definitely need alternative, alternative transportation. transportation. A, freeway A freeway will, will never, never be enough. enough. Zero emission Zero transit emission is the most is efficient alternative by far. Please urge your colleagues and all elected officials to listen to the will of the voters and accept the $68 million now and funds that will come in the future for both rail transit and the Sink Trail. Thank you. Online public comments so that it doesn't create feedback loops. Uh, we'll go now to Lowellhurst. Oh, 
Raul, I think, believe you need to unmute. Do we need to ask him to unmute? <laughs> Clicking on it and we're having some technical difficulties. We're going to work on it. Okay, we'll come back to you, Lowell. We're going to go to Lonnie Faulkner. Thank you, Commissioners. Commissioners. It, it sounds like the echo is on, so can can someone turn off the microphone? Probably the center mic. It's, it's, oh, I see. Okay. Okay, great. I'm going to test. I still hear an echo. echo. Still hearing an echo. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, commissioners. I'm a resident of the first district and founder of Equity Transit. In the wake of last week's display of poor representation of the community by the two currently seated supervisors who serve here as commissioners, we are disappointed that item number 23 was removed from the agenda. We would like to remind the commissioners and the public that we, the public, were given the funds to buy the rail corridor in 2012, specifically to implement rail, not a trail. However, Santa Cruz is one of the most dangerous, dangerous counties in the state to walk or ride a bike. The trail was a welcome addition to the project as engineers determined that both could be accommodated on the rail corridor. But it is the activation of rail that will provide us with a critical alternative to driving, not just from north to south along the corridor. Our rail line will connect us to the California State Rail Network, allowing us to travel by train to Monterey, Gilroy, San Jose, and beyond. In April of 2023, Caltrans noted they anticipated our rail line to be active within 10 years. The chair of the Transportation Commission, Carl Guardino, voted to approve the largest ever grant for segment 8 to 11, our rail trail in 2022 to be built adjacent to, not on the rail. Mr. Guardino spoke here in 2021 prior to the Measure D vote reminding Santa Cruz that our promise was to activate passenger rail for our community. Passenger rail is the most energy efficient, environmentally smart, safest form of transportation. Approving both the rail and trail project provides critical, equitable, robust trans transportation options that meet the needs of many all along the rail corridor and receive nearly 74% support across the county with the clear opposition to Measure D in 2022. Not moving forward, this project jeopardizes the future of the trail for our Watsonville neighbors and for our entire community. We urge the commission to do everything possible, the trail project forward and the passenger rail program forward as well. Thank you so much for your time. Lola, are you able to unmute yourself? Do we have other attendees with their hands raised that we can come back to Lola? We'll keep trying, Lola. <clears throat> In the meantime, we'll go to Jean Brocklebank. Oh, did we lose? Yeah, there we go. Hello. Wait a minute. I haven't started talking. <laughs> Could you reset the, the clock, please? Thank you. 
I'm here today to applaud the wisdom of Supervisors McPherson and Koenig. When these two supervisors voted to move forward with the segment 10 and 11 portion of a trail, they also asked very important questions that they want answered. Asking questions and getting answers is a service to the public. The questions that they asked were formalized in the motion and anyone who was at the meeting and who has, by the way, now read the minutes of that meeting will know that the things that are being said about both supervisors are um, outlandish and unfair. So let's try and figure out a way to have this conversation without personal attacks and uh, misstatements of fact and falsehood. Again, I applaud the two commissioners on this RTC who are also supervisors, one of them my supervisor, for their wisdom and for their willingness to ask the hard questions. In everything that we do going forward for future generations, including ourselves, to err on the side of caution is smart. To do otherwise is dumb. I want smart people working for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, again with Lowell. Okay. All right, so we are going to go to Barry. Long, send it to me. Uh, Barry Scott. Thank you. Good morning. This is Barry Scott calling from Rio do Mar. Um, I, while I was un, unpleased with the vote uh, by the Board of Supervisors, I want to thank um, Supervisor McPherson for responding to uh, emails and and saying that, uh, clarifying that he asked that the remaining staff be continued and come back to the board with answers to questions. I'm encouraged to know that uh, these things are being addressed. And I I trust <laughs> McPherson to his vote. He understands that the Roaring Camp has to move the track at their own expense in segment and that there are other ways to bridge the funding gap. On the matter of Highway 1, completion of the Santa Cruz to Watsonville, the Santa Cruz multiple project will cure probably the most safe part of that. Highway. It's not a widening project. It will be the completion of a years long widening project. To leave it narrow there would be a mistake. And in as much as that project is the only California uh, award for a mega grant a year or two ago, uh, tells me that we need to keep going and uh, build that project that includes segment 12 of the rail trail, bus on shoulder lane, weather improvement. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go now to Sean. Go ahead. Every time someone talks about children riding their bike or an accident that they've been in or um, anyone that they know, they complain that uh, cars are driving too fast on the shoulder uh, and too many cars. So they're really talking about cars. and our unableness to um, 
to manage the common sense of drivers. We're literally powerless at that because we can come to these meetings with a with another statistic, another um, injury, another close call, uh, or, or a death uh, every time. But we're talking about cars. Now, there's been a complete failure of Tesla to deliver completely autonomous vehicles uh, years late on that. And there isn't one accessible self-driving vehicle in production, not one. I mean, we've had electric cars since the 80s. There is no new technology that's going to come along and save us. Ra uh, rail is well known to be the most efficient transportation. Our rail corridor is subject to a federal speed limit. High-speed rail will never exist in Santa, uh, Santa Cruz, and that's a good thing, nor will heavy freight, because there is no such term. It, it's made up as if it relates to something else, like interim trail, another made-up term, another thing that doesn't exist. We're going to go to David Date. David, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, Kristen, yeah. thank you for taking my call. Um, you know, I've been involved in this for about 15 years, and the quote that comes to mind is, if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. How many lies have been told along the way of this 20-year project that we have to keep the tracks or else we would lose $10 million in Prop 116 funds while we discuss spending over $100 million in only a four-mile segment? that both the train and trail fit, despite the need to demolish low-income mobile home units and pursue eminent domain against farmers and residents, that the Capitol trestle could be renovated before finding out that 30 others and the Capitol trestle would need to be demolished to accommodate a train, let alone an adjacent trail. It is clear to me that we are no closer to realizing the dream of a safe and equitable bike and pedestrian infrastructure than we were in 2012. We have a budget deficit crisis a transportation crisis, a housing crisis, and a pension liability crisis. Can anyone on this commission honestly say that we are in a position to prioritize a train in 30 to 40 years over patching our potholes or building an interim trail today? A trail that will save lives, reduce greenhouse gases, and promote safe, walkable communities. Spending money we don't have to enshrine a pie-in-the-sky train only ensures that we get neither in our lifetime while our roads, congestion, and public transit decline. Um, yep, that's all I got, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're going to try again, Lowell. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Oh, that's great. Hey, uh, Lowell Hurst here in uh, beautiful west side west side of watsonville hey re regarding um the freeway i want to say thank you very much for uh, the work that's going on the repairs the fixing the the bridges the ramps thousands of people every day use that uh, transportation network and so i just want to express my thanks for trying to fix the freeway when it comes to sections 10 and 11 Let's uh, trim that overgrown landscape, trim up the overgrown landscape. Let's don't let $68 million of CTC grant money, state grant money, don't let it disappear. Other people would like to use it, but we need it here. Let's get Santa Cruz County moving. Build the trail, use the rail. And I say thank you. Thank you. Any further comments on Zoom? All right. Seeing none, we will close public comment. Let me pull my agenda back. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Oh, hi. We'll return to the public comment in the room. Welcome. If you could just turn on the microphone, sir. It's a it's a button, a little gray button. Is it different up there? Is it not the gray button? <laughs> oh, it's uh, yeah, sorry, I was late. I didn't believe the parking here. I've always come on my bicycle, but I'm on crutches today. Um, all right. Um, I wanted to thank um, uh, Supervisors uh, McPherson and Koenig for their far-sighted and brave vision and votes. Uh, there's the $67 million that would go for destruction and risk and extra expense in Santa Cruz really belongs somewhere else where it can be deployed for active transportation. To, to think that anywhere else in the state you could get a couple of miles for 68 million instead of a whole uh, in, installation that would you know benefit a, another community. That's really important. Um, you know, as Lonnie Faulkner said, this is uh, one of the most uh, dangerous places to bike. And yes, we need that trail and we need it quickly. People have suffered terribly. There's been accidents because that trail's not in. And so let's get that happening. And the only way to do it is to look clearly at what the facts are. You know, it's not like there's a uh, hundred years of foolishness. Uh, it, no, there's 40 years of, of obstruction. I'd also like to say that, you know, on, my, on the other issue that, uh, I am in favor of the widening of the freeway down to Park Avenue. And I do believe that saving those trees after that is a good idea. We'll find out later whether that is kind of like the pig in the python or is, does the traffic flow well because we've got three lanes where we need them. And uh, again, I really appreciate you folks putting a spanner on the works of this grant that will do so much damage to our community. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, we will close public. Yes, are we reopening public comment? I mean, okay. We, is there anyone else in the room, if you could raise your hand that you haven't spoken and you're still interested in speaking on public comment? Okay, you'll be our last public comment today. Okay, thank you. Is this still on? Okay, my name is Susan Kaufman. I've lived in Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz City for most of my life, about 40, 50 years. Um, I am in support of the rail trail, especially specifically with the rail line. Um, I'm asking you to move forward. I know it's a very costly project. I'm grateful that there's $68 million in a state grant available to help move it forward. Um, even though it's costly, it's more costly not to have a rail trail. Many people cannot just walk or ride on their bikes on the trail because of disabilities, because they're trying to get children here and there. Um, and so we really need the rail line and the environmental costs of not having the rail line are so much higher in a fragile, precious environmental state that the world is in right now. Um, rail line is safe. It's the most energy efficient way of um, transporting people and um the majority of the voters have asked for it. Please, please move the rail trail forward. We really need to think long term instead of short term. And if we really want it, we can get it. We can make it happen. So thank you. The majority of the voters really, really want it. And we need it in our county. We need a good alternative to Highway 1 other than widening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we are going to close public comment. Uh, we are moving on to the consent agenda, but before we do, I'm receiving messages from those watching at home saying they're still receiving a really extreme echo. So I don't know if it's just because it's really loud in the room or if it's something with CTV, but if we can continue to 
uh, try to address that so that when we get to public comment on the next item, hopefully we'll be able to have everyone participate. All right, uh, sure. we're moving. I'm yes, sorry, Chair Brown. So we do have um, Commissioner Hernandez back. So if we want to go back to item number two. Oh, thank you. Okay, we will return to item number two, considering AB 2449 just cause requests. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes, I'm here uh, because of medical reasons. Great, thank you. That's all we need, right? We don't need to vote for that for those reasons. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez, is this more than, have you utilized just cause two times already this year? Because if so, we'll need to do this yeah. under emergency yeah. circumstances and the commission would just need to entertain a motion to approve his participation by emergency circumstances. First time. First time. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on now to our consent agenda. Uh, do any commissioners have any questions or comments on consent agenda or any item that you'd like to be removed? Yes, Commissioner Schifrin. Oh, no? Okay, Commissioner Brown, any? I, I do have a couple of comments. Okay, go ahead. Really quickly. So on item 10, I just want to thank uh, our staff, Tommy Travers and Jason Thompson, for coordinating this item. And also want to thank... Um, Luis Mendez for uh, really getting this going. This is an item to approve a contract for vegetation management using goats. And uh, so look for, I think on social media, you'll probably see when they're out there and um, get out and check out the goats there. It's just wonderful. And I really appreciate uh, the staff for finding uh, non-toxic alternatives for managing a a real line uh, vegetation issues. And then I want to um, also, I think Grace Voss just left, but I wanted to thank uh, outgoing bicycle uh, advisory committee uh, member Grace Voss and welcome Jay Riddle, who will be joining as the city of Santa Cruz alternate, um, along with Matt Farrell uh, on that body. So welcome, Jay. Thank you, Grace. And um, that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Love those goats. Uh, any further questions, comments, any items that we'd like removed? Okay, is there any public comment on consent? Seeing none in the room, do we have any public comment on our consent agenda online? I don't see it on my end. So we I do don't... not. Okay, great. For the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, we do have some folks online, so we'll need to do a roll call vote. <laughs> Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Kiddos Carter? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? That passes unanimously. Great, thank you. We'll move on to our regular agenda. Item 20 is commissioner reports. Do we have any commissioner reports? Yes, Commissioner Koenig, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a few weeks ago on March 20th, I went to Sacramento along with our interim executive director, Mitch Weiss, uh, and the Central Coast Coalition on behalf of the Regional Transportation Commission. Central Coast Coalition consists of Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Benito, San Luis Obispo, and Santa Barbara counties. Uh, it was formed to lobby for our collective transportation interests. We met with State Senator Laird, State Senator Lamone, Assembly Members Pellerin and Addis, representatives from Assembly Member Greg Hart's office and Speaker Rivas's office, and California Transportation Commissioner Joseph Cruz. Our request of state representatives was to continue funding important transportation projects in the Central Coast region, uh, even in the face of a deficit year. We asked them to look at creative ways to get this funding in a year um, where budget deficit could be as high as 30%. Uh, we asked them to look at relocating truck weight fees from the current use for debt service to funding new transportation projects, to consider issuing a climate bond with funds earmarked for active transportation and transit projects, to consider creating a successor to the gas tax, which of course we've seen uh, revenues from that go down as more people adopt electric vehicles. Uh, we suggest that they look at higher uh, tiered vehicle registration fees. 
that we continue to have money uh, during this transition to invest in our transportation network. What we heard back was that this budget deficit uh, that the state faces is big, uh, again, as high as 30%. Um, and that something will need to be cut. Um, and so that's what really what the legislature's, uh, everyone in Sacramento, it seems, is trying to figure out now. We also heard that the bonding capacity for the state is about 15 to $20 billion. So while a climate bond is being discussed, there are, are a number of competing interests uh, with other bonds looking to go out, including affordable housing bond and education facilities bond. Uh, and finally, there are discussions uh, happening about successors to the gas tax and possible extension to cap and trade but those have largely taken a back seat in the current year's budget to the current year's budget discussions. So uh, unfortunately, not a ton of encouraging news. We'll learn more in the coming months about whether our state representatives can come up with any creative ways to continue funding important transportation projects in the near term. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional reports Anything on this end? All right. Thank you, commissioners. I will just say uh, briefly, and staff correct me if I've got any of these facts um, wrong, but just a reminder to everyone that there will be 24-hour closure of Highway 1 this weekend from 7 p.m. on Saturday to 7 p.m. on Sunday between 41st and Bay Avenue. Do I have those two right? I always get those two wrong. And Park, thank you. See, I knew I was going to get it wrong again. Thank you for the correction. Uh, so just a reminder to everyone, a uh, little detour, 7 p.m. Saturday to 7 p.m. Sunday. Um, Maybe just stay home that day. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, we will move on to item 21, our director's report, and I will turn it over to Mr. Weiss. Thank you. Uh, last month, I reported on the work that began on the Highway 1 Auxiliary Lanes and Bus on Shoulder project between Bay Avenue, Porter Street, and State Park Drive interchanges that includes the construction of a bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing at Mar Vista Drive and a replacement of the Capitola Avenue overcrossing at Highway 1. Um, as uh, Chair Brown alluded to, the work to construct uh, the new Capitola Avenue overcrossing will require a 24-hour full closure of Highway 1 for crews to safely demolish the existing overcrossing and hallway materials. This closure was po postponed from the previous scheduled dates at the end of last month because of rain and will now take place this weekend. The full closure of Highway 1 will take place from, again, as Saturday, April 6th at 7 p.m. through Sunday, April 7th at 7 p.m. between Bay Avenue Porter Street and Park Avenue interchanges. Signs with detour information will be in place to direct drivers, but we encourage drivers to seek alternate routes. I'd like to provide a brief update on segment five of our Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network. This project proposes to construct seven and a half miles of the trail spine between Wilder Ranch and Davenport. The scope of this project includes a new multi-use paved path with striping, unpaved shoulders, and paved parking lots at Davenport and Panther Yellow Bank beaches. The project also includes a bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing at Highway 1 at Panther Yellow Bank Beach. RTC staff, in coordination with the Federal Highway Administration Central Lands Division, is implementing this project. We were awarded two grants for the project. The funding for construction of the trail and parking lots includes 33 million in federal funds and $8 million in Measure D funds. The project was advertised for construction by the Federal Highway Administration with an engineer's estimate of $32.6 million. Four bids were received on March 26, with the low bid being just under 32 million. Although there is sufficient funding to build the trail and parking lot projects based on the construction bids received, the Federal Highway Administration Central, Land, Central Federal Lands Division, in coordination with RTC, is working to identify funding for the project mitigation prior to awarding the contract. The, the Federal Highway Administration recently received updated cost estimates for the miti environmental mitigation required to construct the project. That estimate exceeds the available funds by eight to nine million dollars. Staff will return to RTC with an update on the project's award at the next RTC meeting. Also regarding the rail trail, we've withdrawn item 23 on the segment 10 and 11 environmental review from today's agenda. Uh, we need a little more time to work through this issue. Our intent is to bring to you at our April 18th TPW meeting, an item that is focused on the scope and funding of this project to be followed by an item on the environmental review at our May 2nd meeting. Uh, there are a few staff announcements I'd like to share with you. First, we're pleased to welcome Two new staff members, Johnny Esteban and Max Friedman, 
both who started on March 19th as transportation planners. Johnny, I think Johnny's here. Go ahead and stand up, wave. <laughs> Johnny has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Seattle University and a master's degree in energy engineering, specializing in energy management of transport systems from the Barcelona School of Industry and Engineering. He recently worked as a postgraduate research in intern at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where he conducted research related to micromobility services and on-demand transit's ability to address social equity barriers and improve accessibility for disadvantaged communities. Max? Uh, Max is a recent graduate of the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning Program at San Jose State University. While pursuing his master's degree, he worked at the San Jose Department of Transportation, assisting in acquiring state, uh, federal, and regional grants and managing grant funding project, grant funded projects. I'd also like to recognize Deputy Director Luis Mendez, who recently celebrated a milestone 30-year anniversary working at RTC. Over the past 30 years, Luis has earned the respect and admiration of commissioners, colleagues, and community members for his professionalism, dedication, understanding, cooperation, work ethic, and enthusiasm to improve transportation in Santa Cruz County. Uh, Luis is on vacation today, but I'd like to bring a resolution of appreciation for his years of service to RTC at the next meeting so we can give him uh, his well-earned recognition when he's here with us. That concludes my report. That's great, thank you. Welcome, Johnny and Max, congratulations. Deputy Director Mendez, any questions? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just want, and, uh, Regard to the item that's pulled today, um, there's a lot of concern about the grant being lost. Uh, can you say I I do not uh, get the feedback that it is going to be lost? Uh, can you say uh, yes or no? But was this day delay going to jeopardize the grant? Um, well, so that the the issue is getting the allocation from the California Transportation Commission, and I have some familiarity with that. Um, I guess I would note I, I would note that at the June meeting at the last uh, at last year at the California Transportation Commission, they approved uh, 18 time extensions for active transportation program projects, um, and that that is just one program. There there are uh, many other time extensions on their agenda. Um, it's not something the commission wants to see, but I, I, I do not envision a, a short time extension jeopardizing this project. I mean, certainly it's the commission's discretion, but I think everybody wants this project to succeed and a little more time to have a little more discussion is not gonna kill the project. Any other questions? Okay, uh, we will take public comment on the director's report. Hi, welcome, go ahead and say uh, your name if you'd like it included in the record. Thank you, Brian Peoples Trail now. So first of all, commenting on the North Coast Trail, that's been delayed over a decade and that's a great example of the approach we're not taking the right approach. Trail now worked with the local farmers and we tried to rail bank that and build it where the tracks are. We would have a trail there today if we had followed that pattern. And so we continue see, to see it delayed. We continue to see it be an ex, exceeding budget allowable amount. So, so we just wanna point that out as more evidence that we're not approaching this right. Secondly, uh, to address the, the grant funding, Mr. Wise, we sent you a note, uh, a request to address uh, with the CTC administrator, Lori Waters, who we talked to and get an understanding that the process for a minor adjustment or a major adjustment on a grant, she specifically said that what we were looking at would be a minor adjustment, which is approved by the administrator, does not have to go in front of the CTC board. And so we're asking that the RTC staff include that in their analysis. Let's stop making these assumptions that we have to do the ultimate trail. The fact is, according to Lori, it would be likely a minor adjustment, which would be addressed by the staff and they wouldn't have to go in front of the board if we chose the interim trail. And so that's really important. And I think it's important that staff addresses that so that we can bring some of the public uh, swirl out of the equation. Because right now, people think you're gonna lose the money, you're not, you need to start. And so staff, you shouldn't come in front of the board, you should not come out and 
and discuss this until that is answered. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any additional public comments in chambers? Seeing none, do we have any comments online? Yes, we have uh, Jean Brocklebank. Good morning, Good morning. and my thanks. My thanks to the director uh, in the director's report for uh, bringing facts out about delay and and losing. I hope that every news media that is monitoring this meeting today that repeated the harangue by Fort members yesterday at their demonstration and in the news media that uh, um, our supervisors had somehow or other jeopardized this $68 million. I hope that the same news media who passed along that <clears throat> misstatement of fact will correct those misstatement of facts and will quote the director's report today so that the general public can be put at ease. It's amazing what factual information can do um, in terms of either educating the public or riling them up. We know what happens when we know what happens when the public is riled up by some politician's name I'm not going to mention right now. But that's exactly what's happening around this. And I want information. I want educated residents. I want people who are educated um, to be engaged with their government. I think we all, we all benefit from that. I noticed the clock was started late, so I'll end my comment right now. But my thanks to the director for the information and news media. Let's spread that word. Thank you. Uh, sure. uh, yes. I have one lingering question on on this. So, item, uh, uh, you mentioned, Executive Director, that uh, segment five is seeing some significant um, potential cost increases for environmental mitigation. I think you said up to eight million dollars. I'm just curious what that's from. Uh, do do we have any information, or does anyone on staff have information about that? I mean, other segments we're talking about tree removal, but segment five is largely through. Uh, farmland um, and along the coast. So I don't anticipate that pretty by the issue. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm good morning, Commissioner Kone, Grace Blakesley of your staff. On the North Coast, it's largely impacts for riparian areas and that we've had into um, red-legged frog, which is a federally protected species that we'll be mitigating for. We have an excellent partnership with state parks to do incredible restoration of some of the fowl farmlands on the northern portion of the project and to achieve some of their restoration goals as, as part of the mitigation. Thank you for that information. We, so we still have one more public comment. Let's finish the public comment and then I'll bring it back to directors for additional questions and comments. Um, so we have uh, Mr. Michael Saint. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, Michael Saint with CFST. Uh, is it appropriate for me to um, comment on the uh, commissioner reports? Oh. Okay, I, I didn't hear anything about commissioner reports. So if it's not appropriate, I'm okay with that. Just a very quick one. Uh, Commissioner Koenig mentioned something about, uh, you know, trying to get funding, raising money for projects and stuff like that, and mentioned cap and trade. Uh, personally, I think cap and trade is is not that great. Uh, you're basically uh, allowing people uh, to pay for polluting. Uh, another uh, possible suggestion would be a carbon fee and dividend instead of cap and trade puts a cost on carbon emissions per ton on the fossil fuel industry, uh, which are normally paid out to the citizens, but I imagine could be directed elsewhere. So in your future meetings, maybe uh, bring that up to the legislators. Thank you. Any further comments on Zoom? 
All right, seeing none, um, I'll, we've addressed the issue of the mics being on in the room and uh, maybe an issue with the volume in the room, but I'll also ask the speakers that when they're calling in virtually to make sure that you have your speakers turned down so that you're not also creating a feedback loop of hearing yourself while also speaking. So we're just continuing to try to address the issues of the echo uh, with the virtual public comment. Directors, you had questions and comments, or excuse me, commissioners, questions and comments about the director's report. I just wanted to uh, um, clarify some information about the segment five project. Uh, while I think uh, the director talked about the uh, remaining concerns around environmental mitigation, uh, I, I might have missed it whether, in fact, there's been really good news about the uh, segment five project project. There are really two components of it. There's construction and there's mitigation. And it's a federally funded project mostly. Um, and the bids went out for the construction part. And it was very worrisome since bids have been coming in very high. In fact, the construction of this six plus mile trail came in. Um, there were four bids. The, the low bid was below the engineer's estimate. So while there are remaining problems with that project, um, the, the fact that we got uh, some bids for a significant rail trail project below what the engineer was estimating and within what the project can support, I think is really very good news. Did I get that right? Yes, sir. Further comments, questions on the director's report? All right, seeing none, we're gonna move on to item 22, our Caltrans report. Good morning, Commissioner Eads. Good morning, Chair Brown and members of the commission. Scott Eads, uh, district director here with you today. I have a few items. I'll start with um, what is probably you've seen in the news and that is a slip out um, near Rocky Creek Bridge on the Big Sur coast. Um, initially, it isolated around 1,600 people, uh, around 1,000 residents, and then 600 visitors to the area. We've since been able to um, establish a convoy routine where in the morning at 8 a.m., we allow vehicles to come, come through the area um, with the pilot um, direct, uh, guiding the vehicles. And then again in the afternoon at 4 p.m., we're... we're um, continuing to reconsider those times in coordination with the Monterey EOC. Um, but the, the goal is really managing risk right now. Um, the more vehicles and vibration we have in that area, the potential that it could, you know, continue to degrade. Um, we're actively also, we already have a contractor on site um, looking at ways to stabilize the slope. Um, the goal in the near term will be to um, put up K-rail, um, temporary rail along that area. Um, and then as after the slope is stabilized to a, um, a degree where we have comfort with increasing the amount of vehicles there, then we will install a, a temporary signal system, which would allow for 24 seven access limited still to one lane, but 24, 24 seven hour access. So um, there's also a couple slides to the South, which is the other part of the isolation um, for those particular visitors and residents. Um, and so we're continuing to work on those slides. Notably, there's Paul's slide, which the goal is to get that open in May. And then just north of that, still south of the community of Big Sur, is a fairly new slide called Regents, which is um, a very tall and long slide coming down onto the roadway that um, the specific way that that slide has occurred, we need to get equipment on top of that and then slowly, well, as quickly as we can, move that material down working in all daylight hours. So. Um, that one, we're looking at probably late July to early August to have it fully open. So um, we are looking at a duration of time with some closures um, continuing along the Big Sur Coast. So just be aware as you're, if you're visiting down that area or intending to. Uh, next, I want to just talk about a few funding opportunities. First, a couple at the federal level. The call for projects for um, three different programs at the federal level, mega, infra, and rural was just released, it's a consolidated application and uh, there's $5 billion available nationwide. I won't go into the details of individual programs, but SEC RTC has been successful with this program in the past. Uh, we're happy to 
you know, continue conversations around uh, joint applications and ways that we can support RTC um, if there's interest in applying for these programs. The deadline for application is May 6th. And then the next uh, program I want to talk about is the, it's a new federal active transportation grant program. It's called Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program. And it is similar to the Active Transportation Program or street, Safe Streets for All, which I talked about last time. Um, so there's outreach meetings that are occurring by webinar, um, actually on April 9th. So that one's um, not really, I guess that's upcoming still, but um, and then applications are due on June 17th of 2024. And then finally, a state grant program, the Active Transportation Program, which is programmed through the California Transportation Commission. They're going to be announcing that soon, and uh, they're expecting to have the grants um, due in June 2024. And there's about $568 million available in funding. Finally, just wanted to acknowledge the fact that there's the biannual packet of projects that Caltrans has submitted. It's included in your agenda. The, Really for us, we wanted to give um, um, insights into things that we're working on in Santa Cruz County, provide an opportunity to coordinate with either RTC staff or local staff on, is there you know, collaboration on any of these projects? Is there a desire for integrating additional elements that may not be already part of our project where we could coordinate, perhaps um, receive joint funding and then um, do something slightly different than what we're already planning. So really it's an opportunity to collaborate and coordinate on those upcoming projects and happy to, that concludes my report, happy to take any questions. Speed limit issue on Ben, ben Loman on Highway 9 uh, that has been uh, brought to us uh, to the RTC uh, several times. Uh, I just wanted to congrat thank you to Caltrans for trying to work out just what uh, this, how long this will be and so forth and what process we go through. It's been uh, really a great cooperative effort and I look forward to it being completed soon. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Seeing none, do we have any public comment on this item? Uh, yes, Lowell Hurst here in Watsonville. I just wanted to thank Mr. Eads for the work that is taking place on Main Street, also known as uh, Highway 152. Highway 152 does bisect the city, uh, also uh, Highway 129. And so thank you again for paying attention to Watsonville and trying to help keep us moving. Your work on Highway 1 is greatly appreciated as it also bisects the city. So thanks to Caltrans, I say, thank you. Seeing no further co uh, public comment, we will move on now to item 24, zero emission passenger rail and trail project update and railroad bridge loading assumptions. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hey. Sorry to interrupt. Is your microphone on? It's like on the, yeah. That's green now. All right. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Chair Brown. My name is Riley Gerbrandt, Associate Transportation Engineer on your staff. Um, I'm here today to provide you a project update on the zero emission passenger rail and trail project um, to discuss things that we've been working on as, pro as a project team and also some bridge loading design assumptions. Um, I do have our consultants HGR engineering online. I wanted to check to make sure that we have Mark McLaren, Tiffany Mendoza, and Peter Graff. Peter Graff, is he in the 
list of attendees. So I think, yeah, great. Did I make an announcement on? Okay, so um, we're waiting for, uh, we won't wait for, but we're uh, gonna have Tiffany Mendoza, um, HGR, Mark McLaren from HGR and Peter Graff from HGR um, support us on this project. And they're being given um, a promotion request to get them onto the Zoom panelist. And so when they, we, um, so thank you for that interlude. Um, so today we're gonna um, pr provide a summary uh, update for you guys on the commission um, regarding the public engagement opportunities that we had for milestone one of this project, um, which um, occurred from February um, through to um, beginning of March. And we're also gonna discuss the infrastructure evaluations that have been ongoing as part of the project um, and provide some recommendations for bridge design assumptions and standards and review um, of the, and also summarize the review that the team has done on the coastal rail trail projects. Next slide. I wanted to take a note too that, um, to mention that we did receive several public comments on this item. Um, those comments have been provided. There is a handout that is available on this item for you guys to refer to and read. Um, as you know, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line uh, is a 32 mile corridor that goes from Pajaro in Northern Monterey County to Davenport in uh, Northern Santa Cruz County. Um, it's been um, an active rail line since the 1870s um, provide, and it currently provides freight and recreational passenger services for Santa Cruz County. Uh, the branch la line was um, brought into public ownership by purchase of the branch line by the commission in 2012 and it has a unique opportunity to provide transportation investments for Santa Cruz County to improve um, equitable, equitable multimodal transportation services for the county. And in 2023, um, your commission directed staff to award a contract to HGR Engineering uh, to assist us in completing the project concept report for this zero emission passenger rail and trail project, um, which aims to bring 22 miles of passenger rail service as shown on the screen, as well as 12 new miles of coastal rail trail, uh, also shown on the screen. Next slide. And on your screens is the schedule for the, the project. We're in this first phase, the project concept report, which will wrap up in spring of 2025. I mean, it overlaps and leads into the environmental documentation phase for the project, which would ultimately uh, lead to the commission's um, ability to approve the project. And then after that, in, uh, we would go into right away and final design phases and um, have a potential for beginning construction as shown on your screen um, early in next decade. Next slide. And as the first milestone of this project, um, staff brought before your commission in February, um, the project development teams recommended preliminary purpose and need statement. Um, and that kicked off a month of um, public engagement for this project, which Tiffany Mendoza from HGR is gonna summarize um, for us. Next slide. Yeah, thank you, Riley. Thank you, Riley. Um, as Riley um, shared, my name is Tiffany name Mendoza is. with HDR supporting the RTC on the development project. Um, so the first phase, the first milestone of the development of this project, project concept phase included developing the preliminary purpose and need statement. As he mentioned, outreach started with the February 1st presentation and public hearing to the commission. Following that, um, from February 5th to March 4th, we had a virtual open house available for participants. We also held two in-person open house meetings um, in the middle of February. Those were held in Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Um, RTC staff supported a table at the Watsonville Farmers Market. And additionally, throughout February and March, we held several briefings with local city councils, um, agencies and stakeholders. These included Capitola City Council, uh, Watsonville City Council, Scotts Valley City Council, Santa Cruz City Council, Santa Cruz Metro, uh, the TAMC Rail Policy Committee, and a meeting with the California Coastal Commission. Next slide, slide please. <clears throat> 
Uh, throughout these meetings, uh, specifically the open house meetings, we had approximately 100 individuals participate in those in-person open house meetings and at 231 users participate in the virtual public meetings. We received a wide variety of comments ranging from support for the zero emission aspect of the project to a desire for alternate modes of transportation to divert traffic from Highway 1 to comments on affordability of the project. Many commenters also agreed that the preliminary purpose and need statement fit their, their vision for the community. Other key topics that we heard from commenters included themes of safety, reliability, frequency, affordability, and equity. We also heard that many participants want to see elements of the project incorporate infrastructure for other modes of travel near the rail stations, such as uh, biking, bus, walking, and rideshare. And we also strongly heard support for connections um, to the Bay Area, Cabrillo College, UC Santa Cruz, um, and other community locations. Uh, the part, uh, commenters also agreed that the project would help to lower vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. And a more detailed summary of um, all of the outreach conducted and what we heard from the community is included in a report as an attachment to today's commission agenda. Next slide. Finally, I'm going to share a reminder. I think we shared this with you in February, but a reminder of our upcoming engagement opportunities for the project. We have just completed this winter 2024 milestone. Um, we're looking ahead to our next round of public engagement kicking off in the summer, uh, at which time we will be sharing conceptual alignments and discussing potential zero emission vehicle types. <clears throat> We also have two additional rounds of public engagement planned as we move forward with the project concept report in fall and winter of 2025. And I think that wraps up my public engagement update and I will hand it back to Riley. evaluation update for the project. Um, we're going to be summarizing the evaluations that have un been taken and are ongoing. I'm going to also discuss bridge loading design assumptions uh, and standards that the project team is proposing for use on the project. Um, as a note, the evaluation of existing corridor infrastructure, especially bridges, is a key component that guides future project tasks, such as the structures, conceptual design, and development of alignments. So it's a cr critical thing to take on early in the project um, to um, uh, get the project team working on the other aspects that are coming along. Next slide. And which existing rail bridges on the branch line are adequate for their, uh, in their current situation or need strengthening or repairs or need replacement um, each bridge is going to be evaluated um, for the following. First is condition, and we will talk about that in the next slides. Uh, second is capacity, which we'll talk about in the design loading assumptions, as well as functionality. Um, and in support of these evaluations, um, rail bridge inspections were completed in February as a first step in the process. Um, the purpose of these inspections were to verify the conditions of the existing bridges um, from, a, from previous inspection reports as well as to assess the, the, the conditions and obtain adequate information for performing the further assessments. Next slide. So on your slides are, um, we're gonna have two slides here of um, just typical bridges that we might find on the rail line. These are not um, bridges on our actual rail line, except for I think one of them, but they are typical bridges that we, um, typical bridges that we do have. So first, just to, um, get you guys um, framed the one on the left is the deck plate girder the, on the top right is a through plate girder where um the rail line the, the rails sit lower uh, and then we have a steel truss bridge next slide 
Um, and then we have concrete bridges. The one on the left is actually the uh, the Capitola concrete bridge um, on the, uh, the eastern side of Capitola. Um, and then we have several timber, timber trestles. This is not one of our timber trestles, but just typical of what we might find on the rail line. Next slide. Um, first, uh, we completed the inspections in February. Um, steel spans, if we uh, did not already have them scheduled for replacement for various reasons, um, were inspected to gather enough information to perform structural ratings. Concrete span bridges were visually inspected to assess the current conditions and to assure that there's uh, there are no immediate structural issues that we um, were not aware of. Um, and then timber and timber bridges and steel trusses um, were inspected um, on a cursory level. Um, and the inspection results feed into the infrastructure evaluation. Um, when we switch to the next slide, Peter Graff and Mark McLaren from HDR um, will be here with us here via Zoom to provide a summary of the preliminary results from the evaluations, as well as to discuss the design loadings and some design loading assumptions that we have um, from the project team. Fine. All right, thank you, Riley. Um, can you hear me? I want to make sure. Um, okay, great. So here's the structures inventory table, which is also included as attachment two to the staff report. And it shows the approach for replacing and repairing bridges that are suitable for passenger rail service. This is based on condition currently. The majority of the existing bridges need to be replaced in order to accommodate passenger rail service. Um, this includes 16 timber bridges, five steel girder bridges, one steel truss bridge, and one wrought iron truss bridge are preliminarily recommended for replacement due to the level of um, existing deterioration um, and um, sig ah, sorry, significant level of rehab that would re be required to meet operational and maintenance needs. Um, there's two steel bridges over Highway 1 in Aptos that will be replaced as part of the auxiliary lanes, bus on the shoulder, and coastal rail trail segment 12 of the project. The remaining bridges that require further analysis to determine whether capacity and functionality meet the needs of passenger rail service. Um, for these bridges, the project team is in the process of developing load ratings in order to understand um, their available capacity. Uh, a load rating, a railroad bridge is a procedure in the industry used to evaluate and understand the load carrying capacity of a bridge. And the resulting load rating can be compared to the anticipated loadings to determine whether the bridge can safely carry the loads or whether it needs to be strengthened or repaired or if it's um, substantially under capacity, it could need replacement. Um, currently with these bridge capacity assessments, functionality is, uh, will also be considered. Functionality considers the existing bridge with respect to other surrounding facilities um, and with the future rail or road alignments. The bridges need to be, uh, the remaining bridges need to be to be evaluated for roadway vertical clearance, horizontal clearance, and whether alignment adjustments are needed for the passenger rail facility. For example, um, in the county of Santa Cruz, they've requested the project length in the rail bridge spans over Soquel Drive um, in order to provide for future bike lanes and sidewalks. Um, next slide. So this slide depicts some of the design loadings that could be considered. Um, uh, the first, the industry standard for freight rail is Cooper Yeti live load. And that's shown in the diagram there. It um, has a number of closely spaced 80 kip or 80,000 pound, I should say, axles that um, typically govern freight bridge design, as well as a lot of traditional passenger rail designs. 
um, the loading effects, and you can see there's uh, two different uh, pictures there. One shows a diesel freight locomotive, and another shows a, a multiple unit passenger train. Um, this, this typically varies, uh, the effects of this Cooper 80 live load varies based on span length and span type. With uh, span length, typically shorter spans, you have say one axle on a span and it produces a fairly high effect from that single axle. Uh, but as you get into longer spans, then you have many of those heavy axles applied to a long span and the load effects um, can vary um, compared to this um, compared to this live load diagram, uh, the effects of the live load diagram. Freight trains are typically considerably heavier. Um, and traditional passenger locomotives can be um, considerably heavy as well. Um, talking about that axle load on a short span. But for passenger trains, the for typically for longer spans, the effects typically become less. So at this point, um, designing for Cooper 80 live load preserves the ability to carry freight trains and uh, traditional passenger trains. Um, if we were to consider any lower standard, um, a loading standard, the cost savings would probably be minimal, maybe five to 10% per bridge, um, as materials are only, you know, 30% of the total cost of a bridge itself. So you're, you're not saving a lot, say, by going to E60 um, from an E80. Uh, and for existing bridges, in order to reduce project costs and maximize number of bridges that can remain, um, we're going to develop um, maximum bridge loading demands for comparison with the calculated rating capacity so we can see if those existing structures can be maintained where applicable. Um, by using Cooper 80 live load, this would preserve the ability to align with the California State Rail Plane our plan and um, uh, and maintain uh, a connected state uh, network to the state rail system and provide potentially coordinated interrail inner city rail services. And this is important for a more competitive state and federal funding. So at this point, um, our recommendation is for any new structures, anything, any bridges that need to be replaced, we recommend that they be designed for Cooper 80 live load uh, for a freight and passenger loading. For existing bridges, to uh, ensure the existing capacity is adequate, um, we recommend that these existing structures uh, be maintained or strengthened to meet freight and passenger demands. Next slide. So this slide describes our next steps. Um, we're per currently performing steel span ratings where we believe the condition is adequate and we wanna investigate the capacity and functionality further to see if we can, we can keep some of the steel bridges. Um, from there, we're gonna develop a concept approach for each bridge location, whether new or existing. And we need to, of course, develop um, a live load criteria for the project, um, as discussed on the previous slide. So some of the existing, most of the, most of the timber bridges will be replaced with concrete bridges to meet current industry standards. A lot of the class one freights and commuter railroads have already replaced or scheduled replacing their timber bridge inventory as it's generally too costly and time consuming to maintain. Some of the existing taller timber, steel, and truss bridges that are on the line will be replaced with either steel deck plates, through plates, or trusses. Um, and the, the configuration uh, will be determined by the analysis and type. Um, for repair of existing structures, we need to, as I mentioned, develop those capacity ratings and, and weigh against, uh, weigh with the functionality of the crossing. 
And for concrete bridges, we want to uh, ensure adequate condition, capacity, and functionality, then these will be repaired and, uh, as needed and reused. So that concludes my part. I guess I will hand it back to Riley. And um, we've got the, the third part of our item today. It's, it's the rail trail um, overview that the project team has um, undertaken. And uh, what we're doing is in coordination with the County of Santa Cruz and the City of Santa Cruz design teams for the various segments of the rail trail um, being developed by those agents, partner agencies. We're looking um, for opportunities to maximize the use of the rail corridor for both rail and trail. Um, the review was supported by a field reconnaissance of the, the branch line, as well as review of um, a, other existing rail plus trail facilities, um, such as the Sprinter um, line in Northern uh, San Diego County, uh, to identify best, best practices and compare the existing rail and trail facilities with uh, what is planned for the coastal rail trail um, and uh, adjacent potential passenger rail service uh, under development. Next slide. So what we've done is uh, look at the existing designs um, and the existing corridor with a focus of optimizing the use of the corridor um, in the right of way, particularly in areas of constrained corridor width, um, which we have several on the line on the branch line. And the goal of the effort is to um, look for ways to integrate both the rail and the trail in um, the corridor, both facilities in such a way that would enable a phased implementation of both facilities uh, and minimize cost. Next slide. So what the project team um, is doing is developing options for trail and trail cross-section design criteria that would facilitate this integration effort. Uh, the process considers, among other things, trail user experience, the geometric requirements of frequent passenger rail service, which may differ um, than the current um, great rail service on the branch line, as well as the operational and maintenance needs of both facilities. And the project team plans to present cross-sectional design criteria options for the commission's consideration at a future meeting to address these factors. Uh, implementation of a, a cross-sectional design criteria would likely require um, design revisions, such as minor shifts to the vertical and or horizontal alignment of both facilities. Such uh, an example a concept is on the screen right now where we could um, fit a rail and trail of both facilities in a 35 foot right away. This is just a concept not meant to um, be indicative of what would be coming um, at a future meeting. Horizontal realignments would enable optimization of space along the corridor and enhance the user experience and vertical realignments could eliminate um, certain elements such as um, retaining walls between the trail and rail to minimize costs and maximize um, the um, operational and maintenance characteristics of both facilities. Next slide. So um, what we're doing is identifying areas um, right now for, uh, for focus for right-of-way um, or structural limitations that have right-of-way or structural limitations such as um, uh, in thir from 38th to 41st Avenue, 41st to 47th Avenue, where we have a narrow right of way. I mean, we're going to, as I mentioned, return to the commission with uh, options for discussion and consideration at a future meeting. Next slide. Um, also, we've identified that um, developing railroad setback standards for outside of the railroad right of way would have um, benefits. Standards could provide local jurisdictions planning departments with guidance when reviewing building and development permits. Um, adopting setbacks could result, um, this would be something that we would could recommend to the different partner agencies, that um, adoption of setbacks could result in less right-of-way conflicts um, for the project or other um, facilities in the corridor. Next slide. And we're almost at the end. Um, so future updates on the project, um, we're coming, coming back to your commission um, with criteria for rail and trail cross sections, as I mentioned. Um, and then later we're gonna come uh, to your commission with a discussion for um, vehicle types for the project um, that are being considered and the different pros and cons of those vehicles. 
Excellent. And that brings us to the end. Thank you for um, bearing with us on that item. Um, we are here, both myself and um, the other RTC staff and our consultants, if you have any questions. Thank you. I appreciate that. Quickly, um, if you could just, the staff report mentions that we're providing direction today. Can you let me know, is that just direction by consensus or do you need a vote? I'm going to defer that to Sarah. I guess I'll jump in and say, um, we will do whatever you do, however you tell us to do it. It will give us more certainty if there's a vote. Okay. And can you say just in plain language for the sake of having it in the record, what does a no vote mean and what does a yes vote mean? A no vote um, would mean that you do not accept the recommendations of the staff report, which would be to adopt the design standards as recommended, which is a Cooper E80 loading for new infrastructure on the rail line and to um, secondly, to evaluate the existing infrastructure for the current operational freight needs, as well as the assumed um, loading needs of the project. So in that scenario, we would, we are proposing to accept, uh, to adopt that standard, look at what the capacity of each bridge is, compare it against what we know and anticipate the, the demands being and then design to that level for the existing infrastructure. So that's, uh, we would carry on with less certainty, developing uh, and with no vote, developing um, different project concepts that, um, I don't know, I think I'm probably deferred to Sarah on that. So but for, can, for I, a, can I jump in real quick? So <laughs> with the no vote, it's, it's the challenge is, so when we start thinking about these bridges and the design concept, Unless we know how strong we're, we're going to build the replacement bridge, it's difficult for us to be precise in the information that we present to you in the concept report. So that that provides a less less valuable information to you. Thank you. May I please add, Sarah Christensen of your staff? Um, I would just add that uh, when we develop projects, we want to nail down our design methodology early and have that clarity. Because if we don't have that clarity, then it uh, is possible that we have to go back and redo work, which we obviously want to avoid that um, costs more money and uh, time as well. It could delay the schedule. So uh, we're trying to be as proactive as possible, bringing um, good information to the commission to make decisions on the project. And um, a no vote would just make our jobs a little bit more challenging as we move forward. Appreciate the clarity. Thank you. Uh, commissioner questions on this end? Saying none. Yes, I hear you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for that. Thank you for that report. Um, so I'm looking at this bridge uh, existing structures and a draft project approach, and it seems pretty daunting. I mean, we have bridges that were built, I think, the earliest in 1904, many of them in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, 50s. Um, antiquated. Um, so it seems to me if I'm a business person and a uh, business opportunity presents itself, let's just say in this particular case, a rail trail, right? If I'm a business person, have you ever heard of the concept of getting to know early and know early? Business yes. people want to know early whether or not all their efforts are going to be worthwhile. Because uh, getting to know saves a lot of money, time, effort, and so forth. So one of my big questions is, you know, we're, we're trying to make decisions here based on kind of a little bit of nebulous facts and projections and so forth. But if I just look at this one item, um, if I'm going to make some sort of decision today, even though it's a, it's a preliminary one, um, the whole concept of money comes into my, uh, I guess, thought process. So um, give or take $10 million, how much do the projected uh, re renovations to, what was it, E80? Um, what are we talking about? I mean, how much does that cost? I think... Um... Sarah or Peter might be able to answer that. Yeah, more Peter, specific. Um, yeah the, the bridge guy would. We are, this is Sarah Christensen again. Uh, we are very early on in the development of this project. And um, 
we have heard loud and clear that the commission desires um, cost estimates, accurate ones, as accurate as we can be. And um, the the recommendation that we've come up with is uh, it balances many different factors, needs of the uh, the branch line, the future uses, and the fundability of this project. So. Um, this is an ambitious project for this county. It is going to be an expensive project. Um, as you saw, most of the bridges are gonna be replaced. We don't know how much each bridge is gonna be. It could be, um, you know, maybe five to 10 million for some of these smaller bridges. Um, and it could be depending on what type of bridge we uh, end up with, it could be um, in the tens of millions for a single bridge. So a single bridge. Correct. So um, we are dedicated to providing that information about a year from now, we will have those cost estimates and we'll be able to provide more clarity to this commission and to the public. You know, earlier, thank you for that, Sarah. So earlier, um, our executive director, and I forget what project you were talking about, but you mentioned the term projects, project exceeds available funds. And, and for me, those words should be impressed in our brains a little bit because um, uh, it, it's, it's like a cautionary tale on so much of what's happening as far as transportation is concerned. Um, and I don't think it gives anybody any pleasure to be kind of uh, just eternally doubtful and uh, skeptical about, quote, rail trail or whatever. But at some point, you know, the whole concept of cost benefit comes into comes into mind. Um, um, the two supervisors can defend themselves very well, but um, uh, uh, on the uh, I guess position and responsibilities of supervisors or all the people up here, we have a responsibility to kind of ferret out the things like: Are there red flags? Does this deserve more, more scrutiny? Should we look at it a little bit more closely? Should we question uh, some of the the reports and 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 just you know what is going down and perceived as fact when it's just really really soft facts? Um, for example, if I look at the at the benefits, I mean m mentioned here in terms of you know what this project does. Um, sometimes, and, and I think I mentioned it when you were in Scott Valley. You know, having a quantitative analysis of of uh, you know if there if there is in fact lower VMT or, or uh, uh, GHG emissions reductions, how much? Okay, you know when you read a read a, any kind of book and and there are uh, you know what an annotated bibliography is where you can kind of go to the source of what you're saying and why it's true in a table that explains things. I think I think the um, RTC kind of deserves that a little bit instead of just throwing out, you know, what the benefits of rail are and, you know, fewer people are going to use the highway. Well, how many fewer? Okay. And is that really true? Okay. Or what have we seen in other jurisdictions, smart trains, VMT, uh, BART, for example, um, do those people go by uh, on their trains and all of a sudden see no traffic or very limited or fewer people using highways, or are they still congested? Okay, so I guess I want more facts and, and you know, cost benefits and whatever. And I guess I just heard, um, you know, we're a year out from knowing more in terms of what financially, uh, where we are, but we're gonna make decisions today that we quote, wanna move forward. Um, okay, I, it's a little it, it's a little dubious for me. Yeah, and I, I if I could, I, I guess I would just add that in in coming to you with any sort of estimate of of future, that it's necessary to make assumptions, and whether it whether it's our our you know revenue projections in Measure D or, or anything, we're, those are all built on assumptions, and what we're asking you now is to approve one of the key assumptions. Uh, that doesn't mean that there that when we get the concept report, we're, we're locked into building E80 bridges everywhere, but that, but we need to make assumptions in order to bring you that, that type of information that you're asking. Um, but I do agree with that for the importance of having that information. 
Thank you. And then just a quick reminder where uh, commissioner questions right now, and I, we will take uh, additional comments and discussion after public comment. Commissioner Rodkin. At uh, two meetings ago, this commission decided by a unanimous vote, I believe it was unanimous, to take about a year to do a serious assessment of the alignment of this system, its actual real costs, what assumptions we were going to make and so forth. And so in both in good humor and to respect, I, I would question whether you don't, Randy, enjoy challenging this and whether at every meeting we're going to hear a challenge before we get to the end of what we've already agreed to might take a year to find out. I wouldn't make that assumption. I mean, okay. that's it would but, be, it so would be faulty. So that, I mean, the issue, it takes time to develop this, these, uh, this information as we've been told by our staff and to figure out. And, and so I, I think both uh, Bruce and, and Manu at the last uh, supervisors meeting pointed out that, you know, it's sometime in December, or we don't know exactly when we'll be done, but somewhere in that range, we'll be getting information that really is necessary to make some hard decisions. Um, I, I think that's, I respect that. Um, I think there's room for skepticism and people will, you know, see what the facts bring us and where we're going to go with it. But a specific question that I have is, I understand that it, if you're going to replace a bridge, it doesn't make much sense to save 10 or 15% as we're being five, or five to 10% um, to build it at less than freight standard. For one thing, it would throw it potentially, I wouldn't say it would, but potentially would throw into challenge our right of way based on the freight easements that we've got and so forth. If you actually build a brand new bridge and it doesn't carry freight. Um, but my question is um, for bridges that, and if, and if you're going to do major, rehab of a bridge again you don't want to do it and then have to tear it come back and save 10 percent by having to rebuild the bridge but some of these bridges may only require minor transformation of some kind we don't yet know we're not done yet with that part of the study is it possible that even if we adopt this general standard of e80 that it it makes sense to take bridges that are not going to take a lot of work to change. If we simply let, you know, in effect, left them alone and, and plan at some point in the future, they're going to have to be replaced or because they're, you know, no bridge lasts forever. But um, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of like, if we wrote today to approve this standard of E80 and to have it built to a freight standard so we can make further calculations and come up with numbers about what it's all going to cost whether there might be room for value engineering in some of these tight budget issue situations to not build, you know, basically bring a bridge that we're not messing with very much up to a freight standard if it, if it meets passenger uh, rail service standards. Um, are there bridges in that situation? Is that potentially a source of value engineering savings? Um, what's your sense of that you know, in terms of where we're going? That's my question. I don't know. I could take a shot at that one if that's okay. Um, so E80 is a standard freight load. The current operator um, locomotives that are in use are uh, less than the standard E80, right? So we're just trying to plan for the future and get keep our options open. And um, if we were to adopt a lower standard, we're not... Um, we are not recommending that uh, for new bridges because of what you said. It's, it doesn't really give us a huge benefit, um, but we would uh, have a load restriction on the line, which is okay because our branch line has always traditionally had a load restriction because of all the timber trestles have never been right. intended to meet E80 standard. Um, so we want to keep our options open and set ourselves up for success and um, go through the, the process. And there will be definitely opportunities for value engineering in the future. Um, I would caution though, that um, if we know a bridge needs to be replaced or a major repair needs to happen, um, we have some concern about opening a new transit facility for operation, building up the ridership, and then having to close it down to do a, a major repair or replacement. So um, 
No, I was clear in my question. I, right. I don't think for if you're going to replace a bridge or do major rehab, it's not worth it for five or ten percent. But but the, I was just questioning whether there might be some savings potential on some of these. Not every one of these bridges needs major overhaul. I mean, some of them probably carry a freight load right now. Some. That's my question. A few. <laughs> Uh, the other picture, uh, part of the puzzle is um, is funding and grants and the fact that this county is going to need to acquire um, all the grants in order to construct this project. Uh, we're going to need to uh, be very successful in securing state and federal funding, and um, that's to build the capital project, right? There's less grants out there to do rehab of bridges and repairs, and so we want to get it all done up front that's going to reduce our operation and maintenance costs and make this um line um feasible to operate and maintain um at the uh operational level that we are anticipating so thank you hopefully that provides clarity mr Schifrin. Yes. Have, um, thanks for the staff report. Has there been ongoing communication or con consultation with uh, Roaring Camp or other private railroad operators as part of this process? Yes. <clears throat> we have been um, in consultation with uh, Roaring Camp. Yeah. Good, because I think one of the, uh, you know, there, there's the Tesla version and there's the, you know, Honda version. And, you know, the Honda version might require uh, rehab more frequently. Uh, that happens on railroad lines. But if that becomes a difference between something that's feasible and something that isn't feasible because of some huge cost difference, I think the commission should know that. So is it is the commission going to get some alternatives that look at Tesla versus Honda and, you know, what what can be done at different cost, um, at different cost levels with, certain, with different levels of risk. Um, I think the, the, you know, I think the commission would benefit from having that kind of analysis. Is that the intention? The intention of the staff and team is not to gold plate this project or to build a Tesla type of project, as you explained. Uh, we want um, something practical, economical, um, and we're just we're just getting started. We intend to bring a lot more information to the commission. And, um, you know, again, there will be opportunities for value engineering in the future. We just need to, we need to um, adopt this methodology that is going to help us give clarity to our team, our consultant team, our staff um, so that we can bring adequate information to the commission. There will be flexibility. We always want to keep our options open to adapt and shift if there's opportunities that come up in the future. Um, so I would just say we're um, we're needing this now to bring the information that the commission desires and that we will um, we're going to figure this out as we go with the commission. So thank you. I think I'll add one thing to, to that response. Um, so item or the recommendation number three on the staff report for um, looking at the existing bridges and evaluating those bridges based on their existing capacity and the anticipated um, load requirements of both the freight and the um, passenger rail services will be happening in the coming months. One of the big um, items that we will come back to you, the commission for is a discussion on the vehicle types. Vehicle types will have a large impact on the, the, the bridge um, evaluation and the capacity. Um, there's, as, as was mentioned by Peter Graff in the presentation, traditional passenger rail service uses those front locomotives for, for transporting the, the passenger cars. They're similar to freight. Um, the freight locomotives, other vehicle types exist um, with different pros and cons, and some of those are lower load loads on on those vehicles. So those will play into um, the cost that we're going to be coming back to the commission with um, when the, the vehicle types are discussed. Additional commissioner questions? Yes, go ahead. Thanks, Commissioner Brown. 
Uh, I applaud the specificity that you brought to the committee today. I think it's going to be essential going forward. You know, the old saying, without data, you're just another guy with an opinion. And we've had a lot of those. Uh, in the scope, following up on what you just said, will the scope of this project include defining what other, at, at the current status of the bridge is, what other modalities would be appropriate, including bikes and pedestrian? We will definitely be coming back with, um, as I mentioned, the different vehicle types for the passenger rail service over the, the bridges. Um, the use of the bridges for not passenger rail service, no, we won't be coming back with this project for that discussion. Um, we will, as a project team, and be looking at how we use the bridges, the, the new and the retrofitted bridges, whether that those provide both passenger rail service and trail on one bridge or separate them off. We're going to look at that from a you know cost benefit perspective, um, but not using the, the existing bridges for different modalities specifically. So I don't want to reopen a wound, but it's my understanding that the discussion of a trail adjacent to or not adjacent to the rail remains open. So why would we not appraise the current bridges for their suitability for pedestrian and bicycle traffic? It's a rail study. It, it's a rail study, but it would also address the question of whether or not a new bridge construction could work in parallel to the existing bridge or require an entirely new bridge. So I think it's a fair question. I think I'm, I think I'm seeing what you're saying, which is, we are, our, our project is looking at putting passenger rail service on the branch line. We have- Rail trail, I believe is the project as it's labeled. Correct, thank you for the, for the correction, yes. So we're looking at bringing passenger rail service from Pajaro to Santa Cruz, as well as completing 12 new miles of coastal rail trail. Those would be segments 13 to 20 and um, phase two of segment 11. Um, bringing passenger rail service to that area will require um, either rehab of the existing bridges or new bridges. So we can, as a project team, look for opportunities to um, where they exist to put new bridges in places that would allow the retaining of the existing bridges for the coastal rail trail. Due to the you know, constraints of the rail corridor, that would probably require acquiring right away. Um, but that is something that we can look at. And if it's the specific direction of the commission, like we can um, make that a uh, more imperative. So, so I'm going to perseverate. I would hate for us to go through this exercise. And should the conclusion, we don't need a train or we can't afford a train. And it's not a foregone conclusion, but I'd hate to get there and then hit the reset button and ask you to reassess these bridges for alternate uses. Mm -hmm. So I would propose it would make sense to ask both questions simultaneously. Forgive me for interrupting, but I'm assuming if a bridge can handle E80 loads of a train, it can handle some bikes and pedestrians as well. So was that not included essentially within well, the what we're looking at? If the bridge can't handle E80, what can it handle? And could it handle right. bikes and pedestrians? Now we fully understand the question. Um, so. You are correct, Chair Brown, in that um, locomotive loads are of the heaviest loads um, beyond, you know, roadway um, and any other kind of mode. Um, we, as part of this process, we are focusing on the project concept for the um, zero emission passenger rail. Now, keeping our options open, we're doing assessments. We assess our bridges um, often. And um, it would, I suppose, be a subsequent study that would be needed to look at um, what bridges we would go through a similar analysis. However, it would be for pedestrians and bikes loading versus train loading. And then we could, you know, if if we go down that path, then we're going to, uh, we would we would bring that information to the commission, but it is not included in the scope of work for HDR's contract. And we're trying to um, focus and um, 
keep moving forward with this uh, rail concept report. And then this commission will have an opportunity to make a decision in 2025. Um, and then there will be subsequent steps, obviously. So I'll be dogmatic one more time. If we're looking at building de novo, expensive tank train bridges as outlined in this proposal with accommodation for an adjacent trail, would it not make sense to simultaneously look at the existing bridges and say, hey, we can have two, a new one for the train that meets E80 and the existing one for bikes and passengers. So what I'm asking you to do is have a little foresight and assess these bridges yeah. with the thought in mind, there may be more than one bridge at a certain spot and each bridge may have a separate mandate. Could I um, respond to that? Because what's really being asked for here is that uh, we spend more money that we don't have. Um, we're going to be lucky to do the, uh, to get the money to complete the rail study. To start adding things on uh, is going to cost more money, take more time, and just make it more difficult to reach a meaningful conclusion. Um, I think it's important to um, move forward with this. Um, and the, you know, so I don't is see trail any being dropped. If is trail now, is it just rail only? Can I bring this back to staff? Yes, for responses. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't interrupt you, so I didn't appreciate being interrupted. Mitch, do you want oh, me to take I, this? I, I, just, I just wanted a clarification of the question because I think that might help us. Are you asking um, if we have a place where we have an existing bridge that we are not sure we have to replace now. That we look to see, is there some option to bo do both the rail and trail that might keep the existing bridge, for example, for like pedestrian, and then build a rail only bridge that would be somehow better than refurbishing the existing bridge or replacing the existing bridge with something that's, that's gonna do both. I mean, is that, is that so it's door number one. Should, should a bridge not be able to reasonably upgrade it to E80? And we are postulating a new train bridge will be built. Would it be better and cheaper to build a new bridge that was both or better and cheaper to leave the existing bridge if it could handle pedestrian and build a new rail bridge? Thank you. That would depend on a case by case basis. Uh, we are Developing the alignments, the alignments are another factor that we need to consider because if we need to straighten out some of these tighter curves, we need to shift the alignment over. Maybe we need to acquire right of way, hopefully not, but um, there is a possibility um, that a scenario may exist in the future that could look at, I guess, converting an, an existing railroad bridge to a trail bridge potentially, and then building the, you know, rail bridge adjacent. That is my question. And then just to clarify, in order to do an analysis to look at a bridge for a trail to to convert, I guess, um, a rail bridge to a trail bridge, similar to the study we did, I think, in 2021 for the Capitola Trestle, it would be a separate analysis and it, it's not included as part of this concept report process um, to the extent that um, that you're describing. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, as we are being asked to direct staff to design new infrastructure to support the E80 loading, um, are those designs going to include the trail in the design? Or are we talking strictly rail? Or do we need to specify that here today? You uh, don't need to specify that today. Um, as part of our project, we will look at what the optimal use of um, the alignment is and whether or not fitting a trail onto a rail bridge, like designing it for both modes at the same time for, for new infrastructure for a specific um, is worthwhile. Um, when you do a design for a railroad bridge, it's obviously a very hefty bridge um, because of the, the load rate, the loadings. Um, adding additional width to add a trail is basically just widening that bridge with mm -hmm. the same loading scenario. Um, so 
that is a detraction from that type of a scenario. We'll look at what the best is. Um, sometimes is cheaper or more effective um, because of various reasons to build two separate bridges because of the the loading differences are pretty extreme between the two different types. Right. Okay. Um, were you going to say something? Yeah. I mean, I just want to reiterate that the, the project is, and maybe we can bring up that the, the map in, in the presentation. It's the length of the the rail line and the and, and a portion of the the southern section. 13 through seconds, 13 through 18 of the trail, our intent is to deal with both of them. And so we're, you know, there may be situations where they're on the same bridge, they're different bridges, but if we decide that for some reason we have an existing bridge and that's fine for, for freight, we're not just going to forget about the, the, the trails together. Yep. Yep. I mean, even if they're not on the same alignment, we recognize that the project is the whole, that whole section of trail. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to figure out how we do it at these different bridges. Got it. Um, and then I have a separate question just to make sure my understanding is correct. Part of the reason we're being asked to approve the industry standard of Cooper E80 is that there are state and federal grants to um, basically connect our rail line to statewide and national networks, and those would not be available if we decided to cut costs and have it at a lower rating. Can you speak to that a little bit? Thank you for the question. Uh, the, the, basically, we want to set ourselves up for success. It's not that we would not be successful in getting those grants. Uh, we don't actually know, but we're trying to um, keep our options open. And by uh, aligning our uh, approach for this project with um, what's envisioned in the state rail plan. It gives us the uh, a better shot at obtaining grants from the state as well as the feds. And and part of and part of that conversation is um, goes back to what type of service we're going to be providing on the rail line, um, and aligning with the state rail plan. Um, at this time requires um, it to be inner city rail connections. So our service would be able to provide that um, and setting ourselves up for success, as Sarah said, um, with a Cooper E80 design load for the new infrastructure, um, just keeps all those options on the table. So most likely, or it's of the opinion that it's a high probability that by cutting costs and having it less than E80 uh, would outweigh the benefit of having E80 because we would have a higher probability of obtaining grants. Correct. Thank you. Additional commissioner questions, comments, or questions at this time, I guess? Yeah, I, I think this is going to be a necessary um, project that we have to go through and, and find out. But I, I just want to make sure, uh, following up on this discussion, we make clear if we don't have the rail trail, uh, the trail uh, right in, alongside, there's a clear definition. I get, I'm sure there would be, but uh, specifically, we really need to know if, if there's not a trail along with this rail line, where is it and how does it accommodate the trail aspect of this rail trail project? Completely agree, sir. Yes, go ahead, Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to make sure I understand correctly, there's a lot of, lot of replace uh, labels on there. So basically, if we're going to design for a train, we've got to get rid of pretty much all the historic timber trestles, and such as Aptos Creek, uh, Capitola Trestle, Hidden Beach Trestle, and replace them with concrete. Is that correct? Um, we wouldn't have to necessarily replace them with concrete. Um, they're steel or concrete. Um, but Many of those bridges on there would not be uh, supporting passenger rail service, as is shown on the list. Right. Okay. Steel or concrete, but yep. timber trestles go. Um, which actually, maybe it's an opportunity. I mean, Aptos, uh, so far we've been looking at trail train concepts with two bridges there. I mean, is, are we potentially going to have a different opportunity for segment 12 of the rail trail where we just have one rail and bike pedestrian bridge combined? So this project specifically doesn't look at the segment 12. Um, so that's the other, the other project that's being delivered by the RTC or um, 
I could answer this one. Pass, pass it over to um, we are well into final design for that project. So in order to go back, we'd have to amend our consultant contract and do some rework. So we're um, we're at this point staying uh, the course of having two separate bridges. Okay, thanks. Further sure, <laughs> commissioner questions? Okay, I have a couple. Um, so I, I just want to clarify that um, having a, a E80 rating is not in conflict with value engineering. Correct. Correct. Great. Thank you. Um, and then the structures inventory says preliminary across the back. So I'm assuming this will return to us at a, at a later date with some updates and additional information. Yeah, as things get refined, we'll come back with updates. Great, thank you. And so then I appreciate uh, Commissioner Koenig asking this question because I think there is a myth in the community that all of these timber trestles are going to be placed with concrete overpasses. And I appreciate that the steel trestles look very similar in a lot of cases to the timber trestles. And so I know that with um, our Aptos bridge, we did kind of a design study with the community. So will we have similar community outreach in designing um, these replacements? I think we will. Um, that'll be in as we go further into the next stage of the projects, not during this project concept. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, you know, the RTC is very interested in public engagement, Absolutely. as is the commission. Great. Okay. Uh, I think that was it for me. Thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no further questions from the commission, we will bring this now to public comment. And we'll start with those in the room. Mr. Peoples, welcome. Thank you, Brian Peoples Trail. Now, this is actually a phenomenal effort you guys are doing because it really helps us drive our next decision on the ultimate trail versus the interim trip. The key thing that we're really not discussing, we're talking about destroying all the trestles. That's a given. But what's really a value added is the setback requirements. We've been telling this commission for years now that there's the setback requirements for fast moving trains. You can't have a 60 mile an hour train and have a trail right eight and a half feet away from it. It has to be separated. And we know that. And they actually, in his request, he's actually for exemptions on that where he talked about 41st Avenue. The other thing that they don't talk about is the barriers, the huge barriers that you're going to be required to so that people don't get run over by these trains, which is going to violate the Coastal Act because it's going to prevent people from getting to the trail. So this is really good to understand that if we build the ultimate trail, it's going to be realigned. It's going to require. So we went and spent all this money for this ultimate trail. But that ultimate trail, based off of what we're hearing today, is not the ultimate location. It's going, in many locations, we're going to have to realign it, vertical and horizontal alignments. And that's what the important message is here. And so what this communication is, where we should take it, where this commission to say, this is evidence that we don't know exactly what the configuration of the trail will be. So let's build the interim trail today. Let's build it now. Go ahead and keep doing your research on the train. But this is great now. Now we know that you're, the ultimate trail is not going to be the ultimate trail. It's not going to remain in the same spot because you have vertical and horizontal alignments and you have setback requirements that you can't meet currently with a 27-foot wide trail at 40, 41st Avenue. And that's the problem. But again, great work. You're, you're doing exactly what we need to do. And by all means, approve what they're asking. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hey, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Judy Gittleson from Watsonville, and I encourage us to approve the staff's report. And I think that making it freight allowable and encouraging freight is really a ticket to getting federal and state funding. And I also want to say that this report came out today where the Bay Area has made impact on reducing emissions and uh, different than the um, rest of the country. And I think that with the passenger rail and with freight, we can really reduce emissions here. And I think it's necessary. I think the body, the job of this body of government is to obtain funding for transportation programs. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We could align with a private partnership that could come in and do this project rapidly. They're doing it all over the country. And so we may as well obtain all the funding and get freight off the uh, truck 
runway as much as possible too. So I encourage us to approve this staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, yes, um, calling this zero emission rail is such a misnomer. I mean, I spoke with uh, one of the consultants at one of the, the public meetings over at the Live Oak Grange about the idea that if you're going to take out all the mature trees, if you're going to put in a huge amount of concrete or steel, you've got greenhouse gas emissions embedded in that. How long would it ever take if you manage to have an electric train to mitigate that? So I, to call it zero emission, I think, is really uh, off the mark. I also wanted to say that the the it sure appears that staff has, from the beginning, put their finger on the scale and said, this is, tra this is a train-only project, and we're not going to provide the commissioners with the information that they need in order to actually come to the conclusion that uh, a, a trail-only uh, configuration, what was called a uh, interim trail, is uh, is really the only path forward here. And so, uh, yeah, go ahead and 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 do the do your estimates in terms of you know the the heavy duty idea that you're actually going to have freight in Santa Cruz when there's no industry here that has freight, other than other than our folks up in the mountains there, uh, Roaring Camp, who are looking to spend a few million dollars so that they can get a billion dollars worth of federal and state and local subsidy in order to move a few things around for their own benefit. Again, I, I think that uh, listening to Roaring Camp on this issue is really not in our public interest. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment in the room? Hi, welcome. Terry Thomas from Capitola. Um, I have a question because I, I couldn't read it, the fine print of your preliminary. How many bridges are in this project? It was on a slide, but I couldn't see. So right now is time for, for public comment to address the commission. Once public comment is open, okay, the commission well, can ask staff and to respond. And of those bridges, how many can really accommodate the rail and the trail in the same location? Because that's an assumption that we've all made, and apparently it's not true. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, I would just like to indicate that I believe working with a, a Warren Camp does have public, is good for the public, the public interest. There's a lot of uh, educational value for elementary school age children at Warren Camp, especially with it butt up against the state park. So there you go. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Yes, on the subject of Roaring Camp, there's a whole lot more than, you know, providing rides to people downtown, you know, uh, to encourage economic uh, growth and tourism in Santa Cruz, they uh, deliver uh, you know uh, firefighting equipment up in, up into the hills, and uh, you know they've many times uh, helped out in in disasters such as the fires and such. And so, Roaring Cap is is very important, and to be able to carry heavy equipment uh, through the, the, the county, uh, I think, is an important feature, uh, and I think it's something that we should uh, protect. And and also with our ever increasing, uh, you know, our plans to to build uh, tall apartment buildings in the downtown to increase the population density in the city and the county, I think we we do need to move forward with some sort of mass transit rail uh, transit solution. So I really think that we need to keep the wheels rolling, get that train moving, uh, because we're going to need it, and so we need to definitely plan ahead. Thank you. Any further comments in chambers? Seeing none, we'll go to Zoom. And we'll start with Johanna Lighthill. Um, before beginning the rail concept report, HDR Engineering informed the commission 
in their proposed scope of services back in uh, December of 2022, that there could be some challenges having both rail and trail in the, con in the corridor. Additional right-of-way might be needed. Parts of the trail might need to be redesigned or even reconstructed. Uh, today's staff report echoes that. It says that revisions may include minor shifts to the vertical and horizontal alignment of both facilities. It also states that the project team is developing design criteria, quote, that minimizes potential throwaway costs as much as practicable, end, end quote. Commissioners, uh, this sounds like critical information you'll need to make sound decisions moving forward. I understand the report isn't expected until next early next year, but given the time constraints to make uh, important decisions, it might make sense to press for information about the most critical issues sooner. Other important considerations include rail setbacks within the corridor and the safety at rail crossings. Regardless of anyone's opinion about rail or trail, it's the commissioner's Excuse me, it's the commission's fiduciary duty to manage Measure D funds responsibly. The commission has committed eight or nine million dollars towards the rail concept report, whose goal is to evaluate the feasibility of these projects together within the corridor. I hope that you'll get the important information you need before making the important decisions about what should be constructed and when. Thank you for your consideration. Hi, this is Jean Brocklebank speaking. I say ditto to uh, Johanna who spoke just before me, uh, getting critical information, 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 information is very important. I'm, there's one bit of information that I didn't hear today. Uh, and, and I really think that I, I thank the, um, the consultants for, their presentation on the bridges. I learned a whole lot, and I think commissioners learned a lot too. In terms of how it's designed and whether we're going to do a Tesla or a um, Honda, I drive a Volkswagen only three days of the year. Whatever kind of bridge we're going to build, I didn't hear anyone refer to the fact that we live in earthquake country and every bit of infrastructure that will bear people or can impact people who live adjacent to that infrastructure should absolutely be built to earthquake um, standards. 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 So going with the freight standard makes sense to me. If you're going to build those bridges, rebuild those bridges and have uh, and have a passenger rail or freight on them, then let's build them, uh, let's build them well. Earthquakes, earthquake country. Um, other than that, uh, as you may know, I think we should be building the interim trail uh, first until we get the information we need about rail. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Lonnie Faulkner with Equity Transit. I encourage commissioners to vote yes on moving forward approving staff recommendations. We understand that conversations around costs are critical. I would like to point out that almost every single highway project that certain commissioners have approved here have had huge financial shortfalls prior to approval, as is the case with the proposed Ox Lane project. This Ox Lane project, as with most highway widening projects, have huge fiscal funding shortfalls, and data indicates these projects will have no real relief to traffic. Members of this commission who prefer to pri prioritize funding automobile culture continue to approve projects which, which take away hundreds of millions from alternative transit options that would lower GHGs and provide more equitable access. The irony is that the cost to build and maintain highways is far more expensive over time, not just in the dollars spent immediately, but in severe cost to environment and equity as well. 
There are very different criteria that certain anti-rail commissioners choose to use depending on which project they are reviewing when looking at short and long-term costs and benefits. The activation of our rail line for freight is critically important for being disaster ready in the face of potential emergencies like fire. Moving freight and materials in and out of Santa Cruz and throughout California exponentially is exponentially more environmentally beneficial compared to trucking and safer, especially with the new quiet electric rail. Logic and science clearly dictate that building to the E80 standard will allow for all possible future scenarios and possible needs. And contrary to an earlier statement by a prior gentleman, the only reason why we need to remove huge amounts of trees is for a trail. Rail does not require this. So it, let's stop talking about the trees with respect to um, rail. It's actually the trail that, that results in that. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go now to Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Michael Saint uh, with CFST Aptos resident. Uh, I think what's missing here is that a failure to think outside the box for other alternatives to the corridor. Um, all the issues that we're talking about today, cost, weight of vehicles, et cetera, uh, seem to be resolved with personal rapid transit. And I say seem to be because we have yet to study this technology. I realize uh, HDR has been tasked to just study the commuter and light rail uh, project, and, and that's fine. Um, I'm a fan of PRT transit as an alternative for the corridor. The reason, low cost to build, moves more people by far, covers operational and maintenance costs at the fare box, and will take approximately five years uh, to build. I would like to ask HDR, would running very light pod cars have a better chance of saving some of our bridges or trestles or rail infrastructure? And also, I did ask at the meeting I attended, uh, can the RTC, if so inclined, add a PRT system to your study? Since we're in the middle of studies, it would prevent us from doing that in future years. Thank you for your presentation. I learned quite a bit and uh, everyone have a nice day. Thank you. We'll go next to Barry Scott. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Scott, I was waiting for this. I, I the cons I, 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 concerns around whether the trail would fit with this rail project and want to remind all of the commissioners that the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail pro uh, Project has always been designed to be compatible with the existing freight uh, facility. Um, in most cases, bridges would be uh, separate from the rail bridges and uh, safe uh, pre-designed uh, dedicated rail, uh, I'm sorry, pedestrian and bicycle bridges would be built uh, next to the uh, rail bridges. So I think the concern around will these bridges be able to accommodate a trail are, are misplaced. Go to the go to the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail uh, project uh, pages, and you'll see that that's the case. Just as with the segment twelve uh, bridges over the highway, the uh, pedestrian bridges are separate from the the rail bridges. It's absolutely the right thing to do to uh, specify an E eighty standard because, according to the staff, it's more competitive for state and federal funding. Uh, the cost benefit for doing anything less is is not worth the risk to fundability and it's consistent with all the promises we've been made whether or not this vote has to take place today or not is is another matter but i support an e80 standard regardless and that yes the trail will be fine thank you thank you we'll go now to bk 
BK, are you able to unmute yourself? All right, we will come back to you. I seem to have been unmuted again, but I don't uh, have anything further. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we will come back to BK and we will go to Jack Brown. Hello. My name is uh, Jack Brown. I'm a uh, resident of Aptos. Um, I'm uh, kind of concerned with the uh, cost assumptions made here that, um, you know, let's just get the most expensive version of the of the uh, uh, bridges built because we might have an opportunity to further expand the, uh, the scope of, of a rail system. Um, with that sort of thinking, why don't we think that, hey, maybe Watsonville will have an international airport one day. Maybe we should have a track that goes out there as well. Um, we have to think sensibly about what we're doing with these, with these bridges. Mind you, we've lost all heavy industry in Santa Cruz. Times have changed from 150 years ago when these tracks were laid. We have no cement plant. We don't have Wrigley's. We don't have Seagate. We do not have the customer base to validate or to justify having a freight level system here. Um, Roaring Camp, bless them, they're a great amusement park attraction here for the tourists that come and for uh, educating people. Has no part of these bridges that are there. Their only thing is to get a unit that they bought for $5,000 stuck in Watsonville up to their facility. How many millions are we going to give them to get that over here? Um, so please consider that. I think we should have something more cost efficient and they should go back and sharpen their pencils on this. Uh, lastly, the, uh, one of the people who spoke before asked how many bridges. It is 33 bridges. Uh, one of the important aspects here is 26, 27, and 28 is the San Lorenzo trestle. I'm sorry, it's the Capitola trestle. And 32 and 33 is the San Lorenzo River trestle. These are iconic structures in our community that are slated for destruction. Demolition will change the character of our community, and I don't think people realize this, including you commissioners. Please think of the historic value of what you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go next to, I'm going to try BK again. BK, you are unmuted. All right, we'll, we'll keep trying. We'll go now to David Date. And you still have me on speaker like you did, Barry. I believe you had your... Oh, hey, can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah, this is David Date from La Salva Beach. I'm gonna take issue with this continued framing of a uh, zero emission passenger train. Um, and we know this because the extensive amount of concrete that's gonna be required just for the trail, uh, by our calculations, segment 10 and 11 will use 8,000 yards of concrete or the equivalent of 13,000 tons of CO2. Um, and this is just for a partial trail segment. I guess we could extrapolate that the trail alone with all its retaining walls and bridges will be well over 100,000 tons of CO2 and estimated uh, vehicle miles uh, saved from a train would be 22,000 a day, which equates to about 1,000 tons of CO2. Um, so we're, we're really looking at spending 150 to 200 years of CO2 in development for the prospects of having a battery operated train that would amortize in maybe 150 to 200 years. So I think it's just extremely disingenuous for staff, commissioners, and the consultants to be uh, pushing this narrative that uh, we, we get this for no carbon investment at all, and, and this is how we meet our 2050 CO2 uh, obligations. It's just, it's really just insanity. Um, and then the other, I guess I'll just take issue with vehicle miles traveled as a metric uh, because 
cars can be parked on the freeway doing zero miles an hour, accumulating zero miles traveled, but this is emitting uh, vast amounts of CO2. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an inverse relationship where CO2 emissions go to infinity as vehicle mile traveled or congestion uh, uh, gets worse. Uh, so, um, yeah, just keep that in mind and, uh, appreciate you taking my call. Thank you. Thank you. We will go next to, oh, okay. Let's see. Who do we have next? We have, uh, Rosemary Sarka. Uh, thank you. I'm Rosemary Sarka and I do work with Roaring Camp. Uh, as I understand it, going forward, a yes vote simply requires assume two assumptions, uh, one being an E80 standard, which would provide for possibilities for funding that another standard would not, and also would provide for a number of options you might not otherwise have. So that seems pretty obvious. And then the the second assumption is let us go forward. Uh, and that seems to be a perfectly reasonable suggestion. I, I would also point out that there are a lot of developments now in railroad technology, um, concrete panels and other uh, ways of building bridges, which are not quite as intimidating as that list of bridges needing repair and replacement might otherwise uh, indicate. Um, rail is the infrastructure of the future. Uh, we do not need industry uh, to create freight options. Um, I would very much recommend a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to uh, Trink Praxel. Oh, we lost our screens. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to speak about uh, the public discussion uh, about this report and future reports that are coming in uh, over the next few months, that this is a very, as we all know, um, uh, controversial uh, is issue in our community, and there is lots of discussion going on about it. And when we consider public engagement, I hope that the commission and uh, would consider the fact that even though they can't respond within public comment like this to each individual comment, I think they do, I would like to see the commission take some responsibility for responding to certain comments on either side of this issue that are made that do not fit with the actual facts involved. It will help all of us who are discussing it in the public forum um, to try to set the record straight and keep us online in really discussing the facts and not made up um, um, information. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will go next to Jaime Renteria. You should be able to unmute yourself now. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Oh. Did hand go down? Yep. Okay, seeing no uh, further public comments on Zoom, no further public comments in the room, we will bring it back to the commission. Second. Any further discussion? Yes. Uh, I'll just say that I want to support the recommended actions uh, and the motion. Uh, you know, of course, there's this raises a lot of questions. I mean, we're looking at somewhere between 130 to quarter of a billion dollars worth of bridge replacements here, maybe more. Um, but at the same time, we this commission is already committed to looking into what it would cost to bring passenger rail to this community. Uh, 
basically what we've heard today is that if we're going to plan for passenger rail, it's not, you, we may as well plan for freight rail as well. Of course, that's the requirement already uh, with the, uh, the branch line um, as it is today, um, not rail banked. So if we're, I mean, we've, we've already committed to this um, and we're going to find, we'll, we'll get our answer uh, sometime in, a, in about a year. So, I mean, of course it's, might be an answer some people don't like. It's an answer that we can uh, certainly predict as far as some of the costs, but um, this is what the community wants. And I think that's what we're all here to try to represent. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Rutkin. I would just ask the public to have, I know it's not easy on controversial issues like this, but the patience that the commission's trying to express in doing a study that takes time. I mean, we're looking for some a lot of information and make a really hard decision about a lot of money. And the idea that somehow everything should come to the front, we should know today everything we're going to know at the end of a year of study is not a reasonable expectation. So it, it, it can be frustrating. You want to, you know, you want exact information now about what this is going to be or what, and everything is interactive. If you don't know the alignment, it's difficult to figure out, you know, which where the bridge can be or which bridge will work or whatever. And you don't know what you need right away and that costs something and so forth. So again, I, I just think having a little patience, again, not forever, mm -hmm. um, but that the study that we've um, funded here is one that will bring us very, very useful information and useful information for those of us that, you know, tend to be optimistic about the possibility of rail and those that are more skeptical about its possible future. I think it's kind of critical information and it just cannot come to us in the next month. It's going to take a while. Thank you. Further comments? Yes, go ahead. Commissioner Johnson. Chair. So um, I find it confusing, this process. I mean, it took about a minute and a half for commissioners to ask staff, what does a yes vote mean and what does a no vote mean? Um, public comments started out uh, uh, with a little bit of a historical analysis. Uh, a child was killed, um, apparently because of the um, not enough trails, around the Gulch wasn't built and, and so forth. I'll leave it to the public to see if that was an appropriate analogy or, or comment. Um, I do know that, you know, we make assumptions all the time and we sometimes look to history for a benefit. So in that regard, I guess historical analysis is appropriate. But when I look at all the other rail projects in, let's just say the Bay Area, and I mentioned VTA, I mentioned the smart train. Uh, um, you can go to, now you can go to BART. Just go, to, just Google all these public transportations and so forth. And every one of them is in trouble. Okay, every, every but starting out, they were so aspirational that this is going to do X and this is going to do Y. Well, that only works if you have money, if you have uh, ridership. Um, and I just think, you know, that, it's very dubious whether or not this rail project will ever meet the aspirational um, uh, level uh, that people in the community and people maybe even on this uh, uh, board feel that it's going to. Um, because uh, though, what is the old saying? Those who uh, fail to notice history are condemned to repeat it or something like that. So. Um, I'm just I'm just saying moving forward kind of blindly um, and just hopefully and with um, you know unrealis unrealistic expectations is an expensive process, um, you know, and with all due respect of saying we you know we do have to be patient. Um, we've been doing this for a while now. Okay, it's not like uh, I think is it 2016 that Measure D was passed. And here we are eight years later, and I'm seeing on the on the graph, um, you know, decisions of, you know, implementation at 2032 and, and what have you. And, you know, this is a transportation agency, right? Um, and we focus so much on this subject, um, but there are so many needs, so many uh, requirements, uh, so many things uh, that go wanting because we focus so much attention on these two things, a rail and a trail. Um, 
I know asphalt's a dirty word, but uh, we each drive here. Um, and again, ridership is important. And actually, you know, and I've asked this question before, um, because everybody, you know, wants to say that, you know, we need alternate transportation. Well, we only need it if people are going to use it. And um, I would say the majority of the people in this room did not take Metro today because they took their cars because it was convenient. If I'm wrong, tell me. But for the most part, the benefits of, of what we're talking about only work if people use them. And if again, if history has told us anything, and in some ways it even applies to Metro, um, people say one thing, they do another. And that's uh, all I have to say on the subject. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I'll vote yes. I'll just be dismayed if we're doing the same cycle when we come back in a year and say, what about glideways? And then we do it a year after that and we say, what about bikes? And we do it a year after that and we would say, what about segways? I, I think it would be a better study if we were asking what is the capability, the regional capability of the bridges in addition to the E80 question, but all supported as is. Thank you. Commissioner Brown? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, um, I've been listening to this uh, conversation. I've been listening to the public comment and um, I've been doing this for uh, going on eight years now. And um, I'm, I'm, I too, like Commissioner Johnson, am, am struck by the, the amount of time that we spend uh, debating this and uh, how much information is, is still lacking. And in, in my, um, in my view, that is a direct result of the this commission's uh, failure to provide clear direction over time. We have, and I and I really am saying this because I want to thank our staff. I want to thank the consultants, but also really our staff for um, bringing this item to us. Uh, you know, you you get whipsawed and uh, trying. And in your point. Um, Sarah, about needing some clarity about what we're, you know, what standards this commission wants you to be using in the work you do is just so critical. So I'm, I'm pleased to support this today. Um, I'm not going to uh, wax forth and and try to do point by point debate about this. I just don't see any percentage in it. Although some commissioners do like to do that. Um, I, I just want to say um, thank you for uh, keeping us moving forward in the context of some pretty significant challenges, both external, um, you know, funding wise, but, you know, internally here with this commission and the politics of this. Um, keep going. You're, you're doing a great job. Yes, please, Commissioner Schiffen. I think it's ironic that members of the commission complain about how long it's taken to move forward with this rail study when it was impossible to get a majority vote before Measure D passed last year to move forward with the rail study. The commission was essentially paralyzed because six of its members didn't want to do a rail study. And they needed to hear from 73% of the voters that they wanted to protect the rail line in order to um, agree that now we're going to do this rail study. And so it's a little bit disturbing that um, to hear that there's a criticism that we're kind of moving too slowly when it's really been some of the members of this commission that have made it necessary to move as slowly as we are moving instead of what we could have been doing a year or two um, before. So um, I support the staff recommendation. I made the motion. Uh, I think, you know, this is a step along the way and uh, we'll just have to see as we go forward whether the, what the information tells us about what's may be feasible and what may not be feasible. Thank you. Commissioner Rockin, did you have an additional comment? I wish I had self-restraint. I wish I had more self-restraint and sort of just kept some knowledge of the past to myself and didn't burden everybody with it. But 
the young man who was killed riding down the hill on uh, San Lorenzo Boulevard was high and rode a bicycle with no brakes on it and slammed into the back of a truck. So he's not a particularly good example of whether we do or don't need a rail trail. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, I think we're ready for a roll call vote. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Montesino? Commissioner Hernandez? Yes, yes. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Commissioner Koenig? Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Kiros Carter? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That passes unanimous, unanimously. Thank you. All right. With that, we will move on to our next item, the 2050 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan Goals and Policies. Hi, welcome. Uh, good morning, Chair Brown and Commissioners. Uh, I'm Tommy Travers, uh, RTC Planner. So like we're ready to go. Uh, so I'll be presenting the draft goals and policies for the Regional Transportation Plan uh, for the next version of that, which will be the 2050 um, RTP. Uh, next slide, please. So our current uh, 2045 RTP was adopted in 2022, and this um, this version will be finished in 2026. Um, the RTP is our state and federally mandated long-range transportation plan and investment strategy. Next slide, please. The RTP, the RTP has more than three chapters, but we describe the document overall as having three main elements. The policy element is about laying out the community's transportation goals the RTC policies that correspond to those goals and the performance targets that help us to measure progress and adjust so that we can achieve those goals. The action element is the project list that is intended to be made up of all the transportation need in the county. Uh, so everything needing funding. And that list will come directly from the local jurisdictions as well as other implementing entities, including the RTC, Caltrans, Metro, and UCSC. The financial element is um, the RTP work that we'll perform, we and uh, AMBAG, to establish the amount of funds that are expected to be available for which projects from the project list can and should be funded. Next slide, please. The RTP goals can be thought of as the vision for an ideal transportation system. The policies direct us to take actions toward goals, achieving the goal, I'm sorry, towards achieving the goals, both as we progress in developing the RTP and in general, as we plan, fund, or implement transportation projects. Next slide, please. So after the RTC board approved the work plan for the RTP and the public participation plan, um, these, this happened last August, staff got to work on the policy element. We proposed um, making the goals more distinct from each other, which we think makes them e easier to understand and have uh, more meaning. Uh, I think that has already played out a bit um, in some manner in that we have gotten more engagement from the advisory committees, and we got more participation in our public survey than in the previous cycle. Um, 
the the key things we heard from advisory committees was general support for uh, what we drafted, but also asks um, to emphasize VMT reduction, that's vehicle miles traveled, uh, to emphasize this vision zero, um, which is safety, to flush out equity better, um, and to more clearly state that funding choices should be implementing the goals. The survey was structured around uh, vision and goals, and the results made it clear to me that our goals are in alignment with the community. Um, the key emphasis um, from the input was on sustainable transportation alternatives, transportation safety, and a desire for transportation to enhance our community. Uh, next slide, please. So we, um, I'm not going to read through this. Don't, don't try to read through this. Um, but my intention here is just to quickly show a um, little, little hard to see, but just to quickly show how the old goals on the left were a little complex and two of them covered kind of multiple kind of general topics in my, in my opinion. So the, the new goals on the right just kind of separate them out while also fleshing out a bit the environment and equity topics. Um, next, I will present each of these goals one at a time, the new goals, uh, with a summary of the policies that most closely relate to that goal. Um, the full text of the policies are in attachment one of the staff report um, and the agenda packet. Next slide, please. So I'll just kind of read through these. Um, reduce vehicle miles traveled or VMT to in order to establish livable communities that improve people's access to their regular needs. This is about having more viable alternatives to having to drive alone for all trips. Next slide. Eliminate transportation related fatalities and serious injuries for all mode, all modes. Um, this is essentially vision zero. Next slide, please. Deliver improvements cost effectively and responsive to the needs of all users of the system. Um, this is about the importance of maintaining what we have and maximizing our investments. Next slide, please. Establish a climate resilient transportation system that anticipates, adapts to, and mitigates the impacts of climate change. Um, this is about the close relationship between transportation and the environment. Next slide, please. Ensure plans, investments, policies, and transportation decisions will reduce disparities for historically and systemically marginalized, underserved, and excluded populations. This is about being proactive in uh, to improve conditions for people considered equity priority um, rather than the status quo. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a condensed schedule. Um, we're here at the second item here, uh, the end of that. The, the next stage is to adjust the performance targets to make sure that they're still meaningful uh, measure so that they are still meaningful measures for progress to our goals. Um, and uh, coincidentally, or, sorry, uh, along with that, um, our next step is to work with the local jurisdictions on all their needs for the project list. The financial analysis, um, which also isn't explicitly written on here, um, will start this year as well. Um, but that's that's kind of something more behind the scenes, and that's not necessarily something with another public input um, stage. Uh, then the modeling and environmental analysis that AMBAG is leading will take uh, some time to work through. Um, and so it will, it won't be until late next year before the draft RTP is ready. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I have. Um, uh, I noticed that the, that slide says policies and targets, but that should have said goals and policies. Um, so after any comments, um, or questions, I'm hoping for committee approval uh, of the draft goals and policies. Um, today, if you all agree to those, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, questions? 
Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you for your report and uh, good luck on the plan going ahead. Um, on the issue of equity, which has become forefront and understandably and correctly in the recent years, especially, uh, will, will this report give any give us any idea on in, in regard to the rail of how much the fares might be for a Watsonville to Santa Cruz transfer? And or the ridership numbers and how much it alleviate traffic on 17. Will it get into something like that? I would. I mean, the RTP is intended to kind of be our overall guidance uh, as we work on other projects. But I wouldn't say that that would be part of the RTP. So you know, but if if you know if we approve these and we are saying that equity is. And a really important goal, um, then that could be something that kind of speaks to uh, decisions um, as part of the maybe the zero emission rail uh, project um, about you know choosing what an appropriate and fair um, fair structure might be. I ask that because it's I have hearsay and it's troubling to me what it might be. Uh, but uh, thank you. Were there comments? Yes, please. I wanted to follow up on the equity question, and I'm happy to get homework on this. Is there a standard transportation metric for equity? Because in my industry, we look at the demographics of the community. We ask ourselves, does our workforce match our community? We ask ourselves, do our patients, do the patients in our hospitals and our clinics match our community, or are we disadvantaging people? And we ask ourselves, do our outcomes, so does our hypertension or diabetes control the same in all the demographics or are there demographics who aren't getting the same quality of care. So we have real metrics. We hold, what are the transportation metrics that you can educate me on? And not now I'm happy to do homework. Yeah. And I can, I can maybe mention a few things off the top of my head, but, but I, and maybe, you know, I don't know if Mitch wants to add something, but um, there are, and that can be as a part of an analysis for um, a major project, a study a grant application. There's, there are analysis tools where you can look at like what level, you know, it's a really kind of complex GIS system that'll, that'll look at, let's say if you add bus service here, how does that increase the uh, accessibility of, um, uh, you know, of residents to jobs, to uh, schools. So, and, and it actually measures that along the transportation network and how does, how does that improve? That, that's kind of one, one example. Um, there's sometimes there's metrics related to, you know, the negative impacts of transportation. So if, uh, you know, if you're increasing the ADT or the annual um, uh, daily average, anyway, the, the average daily vehicles, uh, sorry about that, um, on a highway or road, um, are there negative uh, noise impacts um, to maybe low income and, you know, are they low income uh, communities along that within a certain number of 500 feet or something like that? So th those are some examples. Um, we, but that's a good point as far as the, the targets, uh, for, as, which is a part of the RTP, which I know in past cycles, we've included that when we're um, doing the goals and policies. And so we wanted to really get more impact, on, uh, sorry, input on the goals and policies. So the targets are next. Um, and I think that's a good point because since now we have, you know, kind of a more, a little more emphasis on, um, equity, I think that some of our targets, we're going to need to probably have maybe a few more targets or, you know, change the targets related to equity and related to, I think specifically, um, the positive and negative, um, benefits to, to like equity priority and, and disadvantage areas. And I would just add to that, that the, the states made a number of efforts to try to figure out like who are the communities we're talking about. And as, as you know, as you all know, we all know, and you know, what works in Santa Cruz is not necessarily the same thing that works in LA or San Francisco. Um, they have done a, you know, a couple of tools like you know, Cal Enviro screen is one that came out of Cal EPA, which isn't focused necessarily on, on uh, transportation. Caltrans has just come out with one and, and I haven't played around with it yet to, to know how it is. But one of the things this process gives us is the ability to define what that means for our community. Um, you know, for example, we may have a, a, we do have a very high 
housing and transportation costs for people. And so an income that may be very difficult to live on here in, in Santa Cruz may be perfectly fine to live on in Madera County. And so how do we how do we focus who we want to target is important for part of this process. Additional questions? Hi. Yeah, go ahead, please, Commissioner Johnson. So one of my questions is I we've heard about equity and um <clears throat> I thought that was a good question that uh, uh, Robert had. But what about efficiency? You know, what about safety or reliability or, or mitigating um, commuters uh, and their their issues? Or how about sis, uh, systematic overlays for our streets that basically need that? I mean, those are the um, really uh, basic things that transportation uh, uh, agencies, I think, try and aspire to. Um, is there any mention of that? I would say that's the that's mainly the cost effectiveness um goal. So that that one um if you look at the the policies that are under that, I know it's a lot, we have a lot of policies, but um those there's you know policy specifically about uh maintaining maintaining what we have so that you know you're really maximizing um what we've already spent. Uh, you know, to build. Well, that was then, but uh, we're talking about, you're talking about 2030 versus 2050. I thought we were talking about 2050. So well, it's just really like, you know, the the goal is to, for the next, so the I would say that the RTP is about for the next 20 years. It's not like just what, what we might be at the next year. So it's really should be guiding what we're doing uh, for the next 20 years. So I would say that that, we should be looking at that that policy that says you know to to prioritize uh, maintenance or other things like making roads more efficient, maybe with signal I, uh, synchronization or something like. Well, that. am I missing that because I didn't see that in this report? So, if I can jump in real quick, uh, goal two specifically speaks to safety, and goal three um, really talks about transportation systems, maintenance, and cost-effective use of the system, which I think are the things you're getting at. Thank you. Additional questions from commissioners? All right, thank you. Seeing no further questions from commissioners, we'll take this to public comment, and we'll start with any public comment here in chambers. Seeing none, we will go to any public comment online. And I see a hand raised uh, for Michael Saint. Thank you, Chair Thank you. Brown. Uh, Michael Saint, CFST and Aptos resident. Um, after reading the five goals that were presented today, uh, you have set forth on pages 25, five to seven. I thought that these were very, very good, good goals. And I agree with the presenter there that this RTP is to start today, basically, and by 2050 have accomplished much of these goals. I'd like to thank staff for all their hard work. I would also like to remind everyone that to attain these goals, we need to start today to change the direction of our RTC projects uh, going on, which is widening highways specifically, and they still also have a project possibly happening in 2035, which would further widen the highway. Widening highways actually goes against all the things you mentioned in these goals. The general consensus I picked up reading public comments was a need for different alternatives besides single occupancy vehicles. To back up that statement, let's go to page 2511 for the public comment results. Number one was improved bike, pedestrian, and trail. Number two was add passenger rail. Number three was more public transit. Number four, more law enforcement. That was a total of 330 participants. On the other side of it, maintaining roads and road efficiency, only 30 people. Widening highways, we had just 18 comments. The results, 85% want alternatives, 15% want to keep the old status quo of widening highways and putting down asphalt. To attain our 2050 RTP goals, it seems the public is way ahead of this RTC on how to get there. 
I hope that public comment is not just a box for you to check off without listening to the public. Please don't let special interest groups dictate your decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further public, oh, do we still have a hand? No, okay, seeing no further public comment, we'll bring it back to the commission. Commissioner Rodkin. Move the staff recommendation. Second. second. We, have a, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Oh, oh apologies, yes. I just yes. wanted to make a little comment about uh, what the RTP is. Uh, we have go through it periodically, and really the only, from my perspective, and I appreciate the, all the work that goes into it, it's a requirement um, that really is about the projects that get listed in it. Under the, you know, the funding formulas, if it's not listed in the RTP, it can't be funded. That's the only real function. We can have great goals, we can have great policies, but what, where, this and where this becomes meaningful is what are the, the projects that are in there uh, that we want to try to do over the next 20 years and that they will then have the ability to get grants if they're in the plan. If they're not in the plan, sort of like we don't really want to do them. So, you know, it's sort of like, for me, it's like keeping the eye on the ball. We have to go through this process every five or six years. It seems endless that we're we're preparing these this RTP. And really, in the end, what's meaningful about it is making sure uh, that the projects that are in there are what everybody wants. And because we all like to get along, it usually includes what everybody wants, whether everybody wants every project or not. Um, because in the end, the real battles are over the project funding, as we see, uh, around specific projects. But they all have to be in the plan. So I appreciate the work that goes on. I know that um, it's it's a requirement and it's a way for you know us to sort of think about what we what's important to us but really in the end it's about getting projects in the plan that we want to have funded thank you you're correct in in saying that it seems like we're constantly doing this the 2045 uh uh mtp was uh approved in june of 2022 at AMBAG anyways, and we almost immediately started working on the 2050. So it is an ongoing, ongoing at all times, which as it should be, because there are always new projects and new, new plans. Any further comments? All right, let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Hernandez. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Commissioner Koenig? Commissioner McPherson? Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Kiros Carter? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we will move on to Item 26, our fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget. Hi, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Tracy New of your RTC staff here to present the fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget and work program for the RTC and the Measure D budget. The Budget Administration and Personnel Committee met on March 14, 2024 to review the proposed fiscal year 24-25 RTC and Measure D budgets. The budget is developed on the revenue estimates from the Santa Cruz County Auditor Controller for Transportation Development Act revenues, the California State Controller's Office for State Transit Assistance, State of Good Repair, and Low Carbon Transit Operations Program allocations, and Hinder Leiter Delamas for Measure D transaction and use tax revenues. The purpose of this budget is to inform the local jurisdictions and claimants of the projected apportionments for use in developing their organization's budgets. During the committee meeting, we discussed the process and timing of approving the allocations, including 986,000 needed to meet the 8% Transportation Development Act Fund balance reserve target. It is estimated that the RTC's cash flow reserve target for fiscal year 24-25 will be met with the carryover reserve from fiscal year 23-24. 
At the end of the fiscal year, if there are any additional revenues, we will first replenish the funds or we'll bring to the commission a recommendation to make sure we meet our reserve targets and then um, approve additional allocations. Metro was, will receive the revenue-based state transit assistance and state of good repair funds. The RTC discre discretionary share of the state transit funds have been programmed by formula share to Metro and community bridges. State of good repair revenues based on population have not been programmed. Staff expect the guidelines will be released this summer and anticipate returning to the commission in the fall with a recommendation to program these revenues. Andrew Leiter Delamis is our Measure D consultant. They are projecting positive growth in Measure D revenues over the next five years, um, which is also included in the five-year projection, ranging from 2.4 to 2.9%. The county's Transportation Development Act revenue growth estimate for fiscal year 24-25 is only 0.57% compared to Hinderleiter Delamas estimate for Measure D, which is 1.8% growth for the fiscal year 24-25. The difference between TDA and Measure D revenues is that TDA is a sales tax based on point of sale within the county and Measure D is a transaction and use tax, which is calculated on place of delivery or when county residents purchase otherwise taxable goods from out of state or out of the county. The fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget for personnel includes salaries and benefits um, and also additional staffing that is yet to be determined. Step increases and in promotions for current staff and assumptions for cost of living adjustments and benefit escalation are also included in the staffing budget. The proposed fiscal year 24-25 budget is balanced and includes the funding to meet the RTC state and federally mandated responsibilities, as well as continue the RTC's priority transportation projects. In May, staff will begin to prepare a budget to carry over unspent funds from fiscal year 23-24 to 24-25 and will bring to the commission for approval in June. With that, the Budget and Administration Personnel Committee and staff recommend that the Santa Cruz County Regional Trans commission, Transportation Commission adopt the resolution approving the fiscal year 24-25 RTC budget and work program and Measure D budget. Accept the Transportation Development Act revenue of forecast for fiscal year 2425 provided by the county auditor, except the Measure D revenue forecast for fiscal year 24 through 28 provided by uh, Hinderleiter Delamis, and accept the 30 year revenue projection for Measure D. In addition to accepting the five year revenue estimates for Measure D recipients, which incorporate the Hinderleiter Delamis forecast and calculate revenue distri distribution for local jurisdictions with updated data. In addition to the budgets, we're also including a resolution to approve the uh, pay rate schedule effective April 1st, 2024. Um, this pay rate increase has already been approved by Memorandum of Understanding as a requirement of Cal, um, CalPERS. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Questions from commissioners? Seeing no questions, thank you very much. Do we have any comments, uh, public comment on this item? Seeing none in the room, we'll go to Zoom. See none on Zoom. All right, we'll come back to the commission. Yes. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, have... Let me let me oh, just say apologies. that yes. this was served by the Budget and Administration Committee and unanimously recommended to the commission. Yes, thank you. Further comments? All right, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Commissioner Hernandez. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Yes. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Alternate Kiros Carter. Aye. Commissioner Rotkin. Passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'll move to 27, review of items to be discussed in closed session. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We have three items in closed session today. One is regarding um, public employment for the executive director position. The second item is a closed session regarding existing litigation. And the third item is a real property negotiation item regarding the uh, tenant relocation issues at 7994 and 7996 SoCal. Um, we do anticipate a reportable action at the end of the closed session. Great, thank you. All right, with that, we will recess to closed session and return hopefully shortly. I have an appointment. All right, uh, we are going to return to our open session. We're on item 32, report on items discussed in closed session.
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The commission had three items in closed session. There was no reportable action on the matter involving the executive director recruitment or on the matter involving the existing litigation. With regards to the item related to the real property negotiations, the commission by a 9-0 vote provided um, authority to the executive director to enter into relocation agreements with tenants at 7994-796 SoCal up to the maximum amount that was specified in closed session and also authorize the uh, executive director and the chair of the commission within their, within their authority uh, to approve expenditures, to approve the individual payment amounts, again, up to the maximum amounts that were identified. Um, and with that, that is the report out of closed session. Thank you. Uh, with that, we are at the end of our meeting. Our next RTC meeting is scheduled for Thursday, May 2nd at 9 a.m. at the Capitola City Council Chambers. Our transportation policy workshop is scheduled for Thursday, April 18th at 9 a.m. at a location yet to be determined. Thank you so much. And with that, we're adjourned. Take care.